for being with us again. Thank you for having me. Okay, I'm gonna read the statement. Are we live, Bailey? I think we are, yes? Yes. Terrific. Pursuant to section five. Oh, wait a minute. No, we're not doing the statement first. First, we're gonna salute the flag. So please join me in that. Pledge of allegiance the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Pursuant to Section 5, Chapter 231 of the Public Laws of New Jersey, this is to state for the record that adequate notice of this meeting has been provided to the public by posting and maintaining the annual notice of regular meetings on the bulletin board of the municipal building, by mailing the annual notice of regular meetings for 2022 to the news record and star ledger in December 2021, and by filing said notice in the office of the township clerk. So Adams. Here, sorry, I turned off my video instead of unmuting. Ms. Gripe. Mr. DeLuca. Here. Mr. McGee. Here. Mayor Davis. Here. Whereas Chapter 231, Public Laws of 1975, commonly known as the Open Public Meetings Act, requires that all meetings of public bodies be open to the public. And whereas Section 7A provides that the governing body has the discretion to permit, prohibit, or regulate the act of participation of the public at any meeting. And whereas is already a governing body to comply with the provisions of this act, same time to conduct its business in an orderly and expeditious manner, now therefore be resolved by the Township Committee, the Township of Maplewood does hereby prohibit, except as set forth in the formal agenda, active participation in the deliberations of the governing body by the public, and except as otherwise prescribed by law, does limit the public to the observations of the actions and discussions of the governing body at all of its regular and special meetings. So moved. Second. Ms. Adams. Yes. Ms. Cripe. Mr. DeLuca. Yes. Mr. McGee. Yes. Mayor Daffis. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Pritzen, and welcome everyone. Good evening, friends and neighbors to our May 3rd, 2022 Township Committee meeting. This is the first TC meeting with our new format our new shortened format. We have a hard stop at 9.30. If we can't get it done in two hours, then what are we doing? If there's a lot to be said, great value and efficiency, especially for a governing body that is actively engaged, a governing body that is public and transparent, a governing body that meets more than once a month, and that provides sufficient and fulsome, fulsome public engagement in many other formats throughout the month through other subcommittees of the public is invited to. With that, we're gonna start uh, this evening's meeting with a couple of proclamations. May is Mental Health Awareness Month. It's also Older Americans Month. May is also AAPI Month. We haven't forgotten about that. But again, in order to have efficient meetings that don't go on for hours and hours, we will be doing that proclamation at our next meeting later this month on the 17th of May. We will then um, appoint a new board and committee member, uh, Rujan Shen, to the Environmental Advisory Committee. Then we will have our first public comment period for agenda items only, and that will lead us into our Board of Health meeting. We have four ordinance introductions. We have an ordinance authorizing and encouraging electric vehicle supply service equipment and make ready parking spaces. And then we have three bond ordinances, one uh, that will provide for our capital improvements for this year, one that will provide for the much needed environmental abatement at our public works um, uh, facility, and one that will uh, provide us a new dive tower or improvement store type a dive tower uh, at our pool. I don't think we have any reports from departments, so we'll go into administrative reports after that. We'll begin with the township administrator followed by township attorney, and then we'll hear from Ms. Fritz and our township clerk. Then we have reports from us, the elected officials. We'll start this evening with committee member McGeehee, then committee member Adams, deputy mayor DeLuca will follow, committee member Kripe 
if she's available to join us, committee met member Kripe is traveling for work, is literally in transit and trying uh, in between airport stops to, to join us. Uh, and we always end with me going last. We have no discussion items this evening and we have several items on the consent agenda previously published. I do want to uh, note a few of them for you. Number 144-22, appointing our summer meals program supervisor. So that's just to say that we're doing our summer meals program again, and that's very exciting. Our summer breakfast and lunch program as well. And um, what else do we have here? And then we'll go into the second public comment period for any subject matter. We will adjourn the TC portion of our meeting and then the governing body will uh, convene as the local ABC because we have a license on the agenda this evening as a plenary retail consumption license for Maplewood Cinemas LLC doing business as the Maplewood for the Maplewood Theater. So that's our agenda. Welcome again. Mental Health Awareness Month proclamation is uh, really important. May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And as a community recently, we have experienced uh, mental health crises uh, very up close and personal. We've talked about them before, uh, and we've engaged with our public health officials and professionals about how we can expand mental health awareness in our township and partnerships uh, directly, the township's partnerships directly with mental health providers. And we're working on that. Uh, this evening, we are going to be introducing our crisis intervention social worker who's here to work with vulnerable populations, including those experiencing mental health issues and vulnerabilities. Uh, so mental health is very important in Maplewood, very important to me and to my colleagues. And uh, it was really important for us, therefore, this evening to proclaim May as Mental Health Awareness Month in the township of Maplewood. The next proclamation is about older Americans, uh, older adults month in, in uh, the month of May. Uh, committee member Kripe was supposed to do that, but I think she's currently without internet access in transit. And I'm hoping that committee member uh, McGee, who is also the chair of our Board of Health, will uh, do that proclamation for us. Mr. McGee, I'm sorry putting you on the spot here last minute without notice, but I'm sure you'll do fine. Mr. McGee? I was looking for the proclamation. <laughs> uh, I, have, I, I have it now. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you, sir. Awesome. No worries. Uh, this is a proclamation uh, for Older Americans Month. Uh, whereas Older Americans Month is an annual event dating back to 1963, when President John F. Kennedy designated May as Senior Citizens Month. It was later renamed Older Americans Month, honoring older Americans and celebrating their contributions to our communities and nation. And whereas each May, the Administration for Community Li Living leads the celebration of Older Americans Month, OAM, this year's theme is Communities of Strength, recognizing the important role older Americans play in fostering the connection and engagement that build strong, resilient communities. And whereas in our community, older adults are a key source of this strength, through their experience, successes, and difficulties, they have built resilience that helps them to face new challenges. When communities tap into this, they become stronger as well. And whereas strength is built and shown not only by bold acts, but also small ones of day-to-day -day life, a conversation shared with a friend, working in a garden, trying a new recipe, or taking time for a cup of tea on a busy day. And when we share these activities with others, even virtually, or by telling about the experience later, we help them build resilience too. And whereas in tough times, communities find strength in people and the people find strength in their communities. In the past year, we've seen this time and time again in the township of Maplewood, as friends, neighbors, and businesses have found new ways to support each other. Now, therefore be it resolved that Mayor Dean Daphnis of the township of Maplewood on behalf of the township committee, 
does hereby proclaim May 2020 as Older Americans Month. And in the township of Maplewood, we, were, we urge every resident to recognize older adults and the people who support them as essential contributors to the strength of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Chair McGeehee. That was uh, well done with lots of emotion and gusto. Thank you. <laughs> um, we're gonna move over to boards and committees. We have an appointment this evening that we're excited about. Uh, Town Assistant Township Administrator Barnett, do we have our appointee with us? Yes, we do. I'll be moving them over to a panelist right now. Terrific, and I'm gonna let committee member Adams take over. Thank you, Mayor. Um, waiting for a video to come on. <laughs> so uh, the Environmental Advisory Committee, hi, Rishan. Good to see you again. Um, it will very much welcome um, Ms. Shen to um, the Environmental Advisory Committee. And um, Ms. Shen, would you please introduce yourself to the community and to the governing body and tell us a little bit about yourself and why you wanna serve on the Environmental Advisory Committee? Glad to. Thank you, Nancy, for the introduction. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Rujing Shen. Um, I have been a Maplewood resident for just about four years now. Um, and I'm, I'm really uh, loving the community, uh, loving the area, and really looking forward to deepening my roots here. And as part of that, I have uh, always wanted to be able to sort of serve the community. Um, and then uh, the in, sort of environment and climate has been uh, part of my sort of personal, you know, personal interest and, and these days actually my sort of pr professional interest as well. Um, <clears throat> so um, I had been sort of participating in some of the um, uh, town, town, uh, township committee meetings over the past year over the gas power leaf ban um, policy. And so that sort of got me into knowing some of the people in the community who are passionate about environmental causes. So when, um, when Bob called me up and about this appointment, potential appointment, I was uh, very excited and very honored to uh, be considered for this position. So um, for myself, I work for uh, BlackRock. I work in uh, ESG investing uh, research. Uh, prior to this job, I was a reporter for Reuters in Asia for about eight and a half, nine years. Um, so in my previous life, I had been um, reporting on a lot of commodities, bulk commodities like coal and gold and all that stuff. So it was sort of uh, sometimes touches upon um, environmental issues. And in my current job, uh, so my team kind of looks at a lot of the uh, um, sort of data and metrics to on, on uh, measuring, say, uh, how corporate sort of climate uh, proclaimant uh, matches up with stacks up against its uh, its uh, actual action, that sort of stuff. Um, so I am really happy to be here. Very honored to be uh, appointed to the to the EAC, and I um, I'll be honest that I don't really have that much sort of uh, experience in um, local environmental policy setting, although I've seen firsthand how complicated things can be. So I'm here to offer my help um, to help the township uh, and uh, fellow citizens who are interested in uh, the environmental issues, uh, interested in trying to figure out how we can help sort of fight off the worst outcomes of climate change, even though on a very, very local levels. Uh, I'm really uh, very uh, eager to help out sort of explore policy options um, to help the town figure out how a better way to decarbonize all sorts of things we do and also help raise uh, awareness among residents on what we can do to uh, both enjoy a relatively comfortable life and uh, also help out the uh, 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 humanity against uh, um, climate change's worst outcomes. So that, that's about, enough about me. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Jen. Thanks so much for that. Um, also, you know, the corporate part is something that, you know, we can engage in it as the liaison to the Environmental Advisory Committee. We can talk about that because um, I am a leader in America or something on the climate, uh, holding climate commuters or polluters accountable. It's a mouthful. But um, and we passed a resolution to that extent um, last year. But um, Mayor, I'd like to move that Rujan Shen 
uh, be appointed to the Environmental Advisory Committee. I resign. Second. Second the motion, yes. Ms. Adams? Yes. Ms. Craig? Mr. DeLuca? Yes. Mr. McGeehee? Yes, and welcome. Mayor Daffis? Yes, very much so, yes. And thank you, Ms. Shen, for stepping up. And we really welcome your expertise. You sound fantastic. We need more of you. Thank you for stepping up to serve the community. And thank you, Mr. McCoy. I see you here in, as an attendee, Mr. Robert uh, McCoy, who-, uh, who okay. brought, so, uh, so thank you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, everyone. Looking forward to working with you. Same here. Okay, and this brings us to our uh, public comment. For agenda items only, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Waltz. Waltz, please provide the instructions and move us along. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Township Committee. We'll now begin the first public comment portion of the meeting on agenda items only. Any meeting attendee would like to address the Township Committee at this time, please use the raise your hand function. We will convert you to a panelist and allow you three minutes to speak. Would anybody like to address the Township Committee at this time? Mayor, first I have Joe Strupp. We'll convert you to a panelist and allow you three minutes to speak. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yep. Welcome. Hi. Um, good to be here. I first approached the Touch Committee several months ago related to the case of Caroline Farino. She was the Columbia High School student who was murdered in 1955 and the subject of my book, The Long Walk Home. And the, uh, we were asking the committee to please do their most to try to reopen the case with the Maple Leaf Police Department and the Essex County Prosecutor's Office. And involved in the book and in the case as well is Cynthia's is uh, Carol Ann's sister, Cynthia, herself a Columbia High School graduate. And she has been trying to get the case reopened as well and get information from the police and the Essex County Prosecutor's Office. She also recently wrote a letter to Mr. Giamas and to Dean Daffis requesting the ability to donate a bench in Memorial Park in honor of her sister. Um, she has not received any response to this. So I wanted to see if you'd be able to respond to her. She's not able to be here tonight, but she is planning to speak before the committee um, in the weeks to come, but wanted to find out about um, why there had been no response to her letter dated, I believe, April 3rd and sent to Mr. Giamas and to Mayor Daffis. So we would request your response to her to make sure we can move that along in the bench she would like to donate in her sister's name and any efforts you can bring forth to help her and us to get this case reopened both the Maple Police and Essex County Prosecutor's Office, as I mentioned at a previous meeting, have uh, denied her any access to the files and the information in the case, despite her being the only surviving relative of Carol Ann herself as the former Columbia High School student. Um, we would love to have any response to her request in her letter um, that she sent last month and that I helped uh, try to bring forth as well. And to put any efforts to at least request that the police department give her access to the information involved and reopen the case and the Essex County Prosecutor's Office as well. Thank you, Mr. Strupp. We appreciate you being here and uh, renewing your advocacy on this matter. Since your last appearance, uh, I promised you that I would be speaking to the Essex County Prosecutor's Office about this, and I, uh, I did so. I, I haven't gotten anywhere just yet, but these things uh, require uh, persistence. And um, if you know anything about me, I am persistent. So I will continue engaging in that regard. Regarding the letter from uh, Cynthia, the, I, I just got that the other day and I will be reaching out to her, engaging with her uh, and with other uh, township stakeholders about uh, a memorial as appropriate. So uh, you can rest, be, be rest assured about that as well. Thank you very much to all of you, thank you. You got it. Mayor, next I have, um, I apologize, I only have a first name, but I have Khadijah. We'll convert you to a panelist and allow you three minutes to speak. Hello? We can hear you, Khadijah, welcome. Okay, awesome, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I'm just calling in about the pool. Um, I was, um, I guess happy to see that the town is investing or planning on inve investing about a quarter of a million dollars in the pool. 
um, for repairs uh, and taking out a bond. I saw that on the agenda. Um, but I remain confused about a couple of things. One, um, I've been really confused about the silence from the township committee about the destruction of the CHS pool, one of the three pools of the two towns. Um, as you all hopefully know, uh, 480 students a year got free lessons um, built into the school curriculum at the high school pool. And with the destruction of that pool, there's a huge void. Um, and yet Maplewood has no commitment to providing free lessons at the community pool that obviously our tax dollars are going to invest in maintaining and keeping nice for the rest of the community. Um, a lot of you speak about equity and speak about diversity of our towns and how committed you are. Some of you have been trustees of the CCR. Um, and yet I feel like there are a lot of kids in our communities who are not learning to swim. We had a young black man who drowned um, after the CHS pool was closed. And yet there's this utter silence from the leaders in our community. And I'm not only baffled by that, but, but really disappointed because I think this is an opportunity to lead. Um, the CHS pool is not destroyed yet. Uh, it's, we, we looked into the numbers, even though there's a, been a report of $8 million for the cost, actually we found out that a $3.6 million locker room was padded into that cost. So actually the cost of renovating the pool is the same as renovating. Um, repairing, I'm sorry, destroying the pool, which is what's gonna happen. They're gonna kind of create a big empty space in the middle of the school that ideally will be used, but likely will not be used because it won't be staffed the way that a PE class can be. So um, 30 seconds. anyway, I'm, yeah, anyway, I'm just hoping that you all say something or do something. Um, this is an urgent issue. We have a responsibility. You all have a responsibility. This isn't just to me. Um, I know we don't all agree on recreational stuff, but I hope we all agree that every kid in our community deserves an opportunity to swim. Um, this is a longstanding racial segregation issue, and it's something that you all can fix. And I hope you do. I hope that it's more than just rhetoric. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. White. Mayor, next I have Heather Soslovsky. We'll convert you to a panelist and allow you three minutes to speak. Good evening. Um, I too saw the um, bond or several bonds, but particularly the pool bond on the agenda. Um, and I very much support it. I do believe we need to maintain the facilities that we have, that this is an important part of our community, but I think it should actually be a part of our community. So while I join with Dr. White in saying we should absolutely have free lessons. And I do believe when I was here last time, there was mention of that, of maybe a pilot project. Um, it, it needs to be, an open pool for the entire community because we pay for it. We don't need to pay dues to be paying for it. We as taxpayers pay for that pool every single year. We're paying for that bond. We pay for the staff that oversees that pool. Last year, when there were issues with your contractor, you used local staff. In fact, two entire departments at one point, the entirety were at the pool. We were paying their salaries the whole time. We were paying their benefits the whole time as we should, they deserve those. But you can't be putting them into a private country club. That is a town community pool, then make it so. I believe you should pass the bond concurrently, simultaneously, at the very same time as you declare our community pool, in fact, open to every single resident who lives in Maplewood. Thank you. Thank you, Heather Soslowski. Mayor, next I have Bert Morris, we'll convert you to a panelist and allow you three minutes to speak. Okay, thank you very much. I'm just calling in in support of um, like I'm pre repairing um, the pool at the high school and that, um, that all the members of the town council speak up in favor of it. I think it's a very important like issue of um, equity that uh, particularly young people have the chance to know how to um, swim. And I don't swim myself, but I'm seeing it more particularly like with racial equity that it's a necessary thing that our young people 
need to have this opportunity. And um, if we de destroy um, with the, uh, the pool, um, that we won't be able to um, get it back. I'm not going to go on, like, say, real long, but I just want to say I just very strongly urge all of you to um, support. And if there are things you can do also for the community pool, um, so all of us as um, residents of Maplewood have that um, opportunity for with them um, swimming and learning how to swim. And I say, and especially our young people, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Morris. Mr. Waltz, do we have any other public comment? Mayor, I see no one else. Okay, before I invite our county liaison, Valentina Richardson, uh, into this public comment period, I just wanna address some of the um, concerns that were duly noted from the past three speakers this evening. Um, first, I wanna say that Swimming is absolutely an essential life skill. Uh, we talk about health and wellness. We need to walk our talk. Swimming is health and wellness. And it's certainly an equity issue. Again, we wanna walk our talk about being uh, about equity and inclusion in our town. While we don't have a curriculum uh, or scheduling set in stone just yet, uh, we will be announcing the details of a pilot program uh, in the next week or two for this season, a pilot program that would offer swimming lessons to uh, members and non-members. Uh, at the moment, because of lack of uh, lifeguards who are sufficiently certified to uh, teach swimming to adults and to others with special needs, the pilot program for now, for this season only, will be uh, limited to, um, to kids because we have lifeguards that are sufficiently certified to do that. Um, we're also speaking to Seton Hall uh, about an exchange program with their lifeguards because they obviously tend to have um, better certified and much more qualified uh, lifeguards who can help us expand beyond our pilot program next season uh, to cover adults and adults with special needs. Uh, this is going to be an open registration, um, and like I said, we don't have the details at this moment that I'm speaking, but those will be provided, um, and they're being ironed out and confirmed uh, via the Pool Advisory Committee. Um, I'm also speaking to my colleague on the other side of the aisle um, over our sister town in South Orange. I know President Colum is also committed to using the community pool for swimming lessons as well. We do think and agree that the township should provide this as a necessary life skill and as recreation, but mostly and foremostly uh, as a health and wellness necessary thing. So those details are to come. Also to come, and you heard it here first as a hot topic possibly this summer, is engaging in this larger discussion about our pool. What are we doing with our pool? Is it a community pool uh, as we say that it is, or is it a country club? It's a really important distinction. And I think we've gotten to the point where we need to engage on this and we need to be leaders and we need to take a stand and we need to do so in writing by ordinance. So more on that to come, we will have sufficient public engagement on it. Um, we will follow a process that's transparent and inclusive. And we will, I'm confident, get to the right place. So that's it on that. Um, County Liaison Richardson, there you are. Welcome. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. Uh, good evening, everyone. Just have three upcoming events for the month of May. The first one is a recycling event on Saturday, uh, May 7th from 830 to 4 at 99 West Brantford Avenue in Cedar Grove. And the, the next recycling event is for computers and electronics that will be held on Saturday, May 21st. Again, at 99 West Brantford Avenue uh, in Cedar Grove. Uh, the last event that we're gonna have, this is a new event. It's going to be a, a county and a division of family assistance and benefits event. We're, we're hosting a landlord informational session 
regarding emergency assistance. Uh, through the pandemic and even before the pandemic, uh, we have not had the best relationship with landlords. Many times they feel uncomfortable or not quite sure about our process. So this leaves a lot of residents not being able to secure uh, rental assistance or people being willing to accept rental assistance. So we'll be opening our doors to provide information to landlords and potential landlords so that they understand our process clearly. And we begin to, to mend those bridges and develop a collaborative and cooperative relationship with potential landlords so that our eligible customers will be able to have a temporary rental assistance and transition from rental assistance to more permanent housing. So that event is going to be Saturday, May 21st from 10 to two at our 320, 321 University Avenue location. So if you can uh, share that information with um, whomever, any potential landlords, I, I look forward to speaking with everyone, but definitely uh, developing a collaborative and cooperative working relationship so that we can better service all of the community. And that's it for me. Thank you, County Liaison Richardson, uh, and thank you for the information in particular about the, uh, the landlord and the rental assistance uh, webinar coming up. I can uh, talk to you offline using my other hat at DCA. I work, as you know, in that area, and we can collaborate, so uh, we make sure that you have a great audience uh, for that, because I do think we need to do as much outreach as we can do. Are there any questions from my colleagues uh, for County Liaison Richardson? I believe Deputy Mayor DeLuca has his, hands, his hand up. Oh, you do have your hand up though. Okay, uh, he's high-fiving you is what it is. Uh, <laughs> are there any other questions for my colleagues? And technically public comment is still open. So I invite members of the public if they would like to engage with County Liaison Richardson. You see Mr. Waltz that we have someone. Uh, yes, Mayor, we have Joan Crystal. We'll convert you over to a panelist and allow you uh, to address liaison. Thank you. I have one question on hazardous waste collection. It's difficult for some residents to get to Cedar Grove. And there doesn't seem to be any alternative for hazardous waste disposal. We have seniors who don't drive. We have others who are Shabbos observers, can't make it on a Saturday. Is anything being done to consider alternative means? Okay, uh, what I can do is uh, contact our, our transportation uh, department in terms of potentially setting up some transportation for individuals who are unable to get there themselves. Uh, what I can do is uh, find out and then provide that follow-up prior to the meeting, um, to the pickup that's coming up in May. So we have May 7th and May 21st. So I will reach out and then provide that back to the, uh, to the committee so that you'll have that. And if we're not able to get it done for this particular month, I will uh, work with our other departments to see what other alternatives are available so that everyone has an opportunity to utilize this service. Thank you. Mr. Waltz, do we have any other public comments? Thank you, Ms. Crystal. See no one, Mayor. Terrific. So we're, thank you, uh, Kennedy Liaison Richardson. You're welcome to stay with us for the rest of the evening if you like. Uh, we'll see you next time and we thank you again for your uh, joining us and, and engaging with us and providing necessary information. At this point, we're closing public comment and we're moving over to the Board of Health. Uh, and I'm going to turn over the meeting to Chair McGeehy and Public Health Officer Davenport. Thank you. Pursuant to Section 5, Chapter 231, Public Laws in 1975, this is the state for the record that adequate notice of this meeting has been provided to the public by posting and maintaining the annual notice of regular meetings on a bulletin board in a municipal building, by mailing annual notice for regular meetings for 2022 to the news record and Star Ledger in December 2021, and by filing said notice in the office of the township clerk. Ms. Adams. Here. Ms. Craig. Mayor Daffis. Here. Mr. DeLuca. Here. Mr. McGee. Here. 
Whereas chapter 231 public laws of 1975, commonly known as the Open Public, public Meetings Act, requires that all means of public bodies be open to the public. And whereas section seven provides that the Board of Health has the discretion to permit, prohibit, or regulate the active participation of the public at any meeting. And whereas desire the Maplewood Board of Health to comply with the provisions acts, same time it conducts its business in an orderly and expeditious manner. Now, therefore, be resolved by the Maplewood Board of Health and the Township of Maplewood does hereby prohibit except to set forth in the formal agenda, active participation in the deliberations of the Board of Health by the public, and except as otherwise described by law, does limit the public to the observation of the actions and discussions of the Board of Health at all of its regular and special meetings. So moved. Second. Ms. Adams. Yes. Ms. Kreit. Mayor Daffis. Yes. Mr. DeLuca. Yes. Mr. McGee. Yes, and thank you, Ms. Fritzen. I will now share my screen and move on to our agenda. I'll now entertain a motion to approve the minutes from the April 5th, 2022 uh, Board of Health meeting. Move it. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Fritzen, please call the roll. Ms. Adams? Yes. Ms. Kreit? Mayor Daffis? Yes. Mr. DeLuca? Yes. Mr. McGee? Yes, thank you, Ms. Fritzen. We'll now move on to agenda item number five, which is the health officer report. I'll yield the floor to Ms. Davenport and stop sharing my screen. Ms. Davenport. Thank you, everyone. I will share my screen now. <laughs> And uh, we will move quickly into the Board of Health presentation. So here we go. Why is this not moving? Okay, just wanna say happy Mother's Day to all for this upcoming weekend and happy Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Thank you for uh, supporting. Uh, for Older Americans Month as a health officer, thank you so much for acknowledging and observing that as well. And lastly, for Mental Health Awareness Month, can't be more important than uh, now. And as always, this is a priority for the health department. Just wanna uh, let everyone know that there is a crisis text line. If you text the word home to 741 741. This is a crisis text line that could be helpful to someone who doesn't want to call a hotline, but would be more comfortable with texting. This is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Speaking of mental health, just want to let you know that we have two programs that are going on in our great community. One that's happening tomorrow, actually, at Prospect Church in collaboration with our uh, partners at Mental Health Association of Essex and Morris. They're holding a Mental Health 101 program at Prospect Church. Uh, you can find their Zoom link right here, but you can also attend in person. And it's at 730 tomorrow at Prospect Church. Uh, there's also um, on May 17th, our own library is doing a, a joint uh, program with the South Orange Library and the um, South Orange Social Workers for the therapist is in a Q&A with a mental health expert. So please take advantage of these programs that are happening in May and any other programs, the health department will be sure to notify everyone. Here's your COVID update. Um, our numbers are going up. Um, you'll see on the graph for the seven day average, but um, as you can see for April, we have um, almost doubled the numbers of what we had in March. And for our coverage for vaccinations, you'll see that below, we're still very robust and our five to 11 year olds are um, increasing in coverage. We're still waiting for that for an under uh, vaccination um, status update. Once we hear any movement on that, we will definitely let you know. Here's our seven day average. I'll move the screen a little bit so that you can see. Unfortunately, from March uh, 1st into April and then to the end of April, our numbers are trending upward. So um, we are carefully monitoring the situation in our community and can't emphasize enough that vaccination is important. Just to update you, we are still in moderate throughout the entire state. Please note that um, you'll see on the far bar over here that we have an increase or, or are seeing a little bit of an increase of another Omicron variant. So uh, the purple part is Omicron BA2, which we are all familiar with, but then there's another variant of uh, the Omicron variant that is popping up. So we are also carefully monitoring that too by requesting sequencing for labs. Lab work is super important, by the way, before I leave COVID, I just wanna let people know that as we continue to monitor um, 
any cases, large cases, uh, outbreaks in the community, please note that while a home testing is super important, because once you find out you're positive, we ad, um, advise you to isolate immediately to stop the spread. Um, we also advise people to get tested with a PCR. A lab test allows us to identify and epidemiologically link other cases um, is the only way for public health to, to know and um, do that with a conformatory lab test. So um, can't emphasize enough that lab testing is still very important from an epidemiological public health standpoint to um, declare cases and link cases. Moving on to community health screenings, we had um, a health screening um, back in April, last month in April, we had five people attend that. And we also had uh, the Cancer Institute of New Jersey give out information. People are finding it very helpful. Senior center location is super um, convenient and accessible. So thank you very much. And there's also a um, C test and treat, uh, give the health, uh, give the gift of health for Mother's Day for screening. Um, and that will be um, a free cancer screening at the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey in Newark. So I just want to promote that service as well. As you know, adult use cannabis is a huge topic in our community. We have one um, adult use cannabis facility, uh, the Apothecarium on Springfield Avenue. Just want to share some of these great resources that we have uh, from our colleagues um, at ADAPT and the Governor's Council for Alcohol and Drug Abuse Prevention. Um, this is a one-page slide, uh, one-page flyer, um, double-sided, but if anyone would like this information, we've also shared it with the Apothecarium, so hopefully they're giving that out, but we have these available at the Health Department um, and are happy to distribute them as well. You'll see that there's a Breathe Easy um, metal sign uh, that is also created by uh, the state. Uh, the Tobacco Free um, for a Healthy New Jersey program. Uh, part of that is also to say um, that even adult use cannabis outdoors um, can cause you know, people to have secondhand um, smoke. So we can put these signs up in our town. They're free to the township. So I'm working with DPW and administration to see how many we need and where would be the best and appropriate places to put them. So hopefully you'll see those signs um, in a little bit. Just wanted to let you guys know that we are going for uh, Sustainable Jersey Health Gold. Um, moving on from that, one of our great innovative actions that we're gonna um, submit for is our Crisis Intervention Social Worker Pilot Program. On that note, I will introduce Martha Ustash, who is our Crisis Intervention Social Worker. I'll let her give her brief presentation um, starting now. Thank you, Candice. Um, you can go to the intro, the next slide. Good evening, everyone. My name is Martha Eustache and I'm very excited to be here with everyone. I know this position was in the works for quite some time now, but I'm finally here. Um, I will provide a brief introduction on myself, um, my past experience, and I will move on to explain my role as a crisis intervention social worker and the model that we are implementing, which is the co-response model. So to begin, I am a licensed social worker with the state of New Jersey. I have over five years experience working in the behavioral health field. That, in, that includes experience working with adolescents, adults, substance abuse, court mandated outpatient treatment, residential facilities, and working in the emergency room as a crisis social worker. I also have experience with assessments such as conducting biopsychosocial assessments along with connecting individuals to resources. I will add that I am bilingual. I speak Haitian Creole. Um, I read, write, and speak Creole just in case anyone ever needs my services in that area. Um, I have been working with the Department of Health as a crisis intervention social worker for about three weeks now. And so far, it's been a wonderful experience. I have been meeting a lot of wonderful people and, and I've been adjusting very well. I am collaborating with the Maplewood Police Department along with the fire department to implement the core response model. I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with it, with this model, but it involves law enforcement and clinicians such as a social worker working together in response to calls for services involving a person experiencing a behavioral health crisis. Um, so the purpose of this model 
is one, to improve how we engage with people experiencing behavioral health crisis, to provide effective crisis intervention to individuals in the community with mental illness, to deliver a more comprehensive service to those experiencing mental illness with law enforcement, along with a mental health professional conducting on-site assessments. And also to develop a, continu a continuum of care that results in the reduction of harm, arrest, and use of emergency departments, and that promotes the development of an access to quality mental health treatment and services. So the goal for this model, first and foremost, is to ensure safety for everyone. That includes reducing injuries to the individual experiencing mental illness, the officers, and other people involved. Um, to reduce hospitalization and or arrest of mentally ill individual, and also to increase voluntary hospital transport. I know there's been an issue with, um, you know, having screeners come along, um, usually it takes hours, but instead of the person being involuntary, maybe we I can work with them to encourage them using motivational interviewing techniques to have them go voluntary. That way um, it can reduce um, time for the officers. Um, and also the most important thing is to follow up. And I put that in bold and italicize that because that's very important to follow up with individuals, family members and caregivers after a crisis to reduce the likelihood of further crisis situations and also better and faster access to mental health care and other supportive services for those experiencing a crisis, mental health emergency or substance use disorder which can lead to a better prognosis. And also this can increase um, the office's capacity to respond to people in crisis and de-escalate the intense or emotional crisis situation and in turn reduce repeat calls for services. So I would basically work as a liaison between the hospital just to make sure that they get the proper care so that they don't keep calling back. So how would this work? So when a 911 call is made, the dispatcher responds. Um, the dispatcher notifies the officer or the fire department and they're called to the scene, um, to the crisis. Now the officers who have been dispatched or find themselves on a call that would benefit from the crisis intervention social worker, they can request me for assistance. I can do so, um, for example, if it's the screener where, you know, they're waiting for a screener, the person is not willing to go into the ambulance to go to the hospital, I can go to the scene. Once it's been cleared for safety, I can go to the scene and encourage that individual to go voluntary. That way we can save the screener from having to make the trip here and also we'll save the officer's time. Um, follow-up services. I would perform follow-up services, um, either home visits, if a referral is made outside of my hours, which I will discuss. Um, and it's to clients who would benefit from either a home visit or a phone call, or it could be a follow-up service after receiving a tip from community members, social service agencies, or schools, with, of course, the assist assistance of the police department and fire department. So, like I mentioned earlier, I've been here for three weeks and I've been working hard. So since starting this position, I have responded to numerous cases involving homelessness and linking them to shelters, um, individuals suffering from either depression or anxiety as a result of domestic violence and referring them to therapy that focuses on trauma-informed care, and also individuals experiencing grief providing them with services to grief counseling and other services that can help the individual and their family members, especially if it involves kids. Families who have children that are suffering from depression or engaging in self-injurious behaviors coordinate. I've been coordinating with the school social workers and following up with additional resources such as perform care. And for the seniors who have chronic medical condition, I serve as a liaison when communicating with hospital medical teams to coordinate appropriate discharge referral and aftercare. So 
I like I said, I've been working really hard. But if you guys ever have any questions or have referrals, you can always email me. My email is posted here and also my phone number. And I my, this is my work cell phone number. And I will mention that my work schedule is Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. And Sundays, 5 p.m. to 2 a.m. Thank you, everyone. Welcome, Martha. Um, we're going to go ahead and move forward. I want to thank uh, uh, you know uh, the Board of Health for that wonderful report. I allow I'd like to open up the floor for any questions that my colleagues would have of the Board of Health. I have a couple of questions and a couple of remarks. I'll start with my remarks. I want to thank our public health officer for her continued leadership, especially in the area of mental health. Um, it's really, really important for us to just get in the habit, if nothing else, uh, in the habit of talking about mental health the way we talk about heart health or other kinds of health. Mental health is the same. Remove the stigma. Um, I also want to applaud, <clears throat> excuse me, the department um, in its oversight and its implementation of the crisis intervention social worker. Martha, welcome. You said you have arrived and you've been in our community this whole time. You're a Maplewoodian, so you know the community, you know our vulnerabilities. And Haitian Creole, que pasa, right? Or que pasa? Frank, help me out here. Help me out. I'm trying que to pase. say. <laughs> okay. All, right. All, right, Frank. All right, I'm trying, I'm trying. So listen, congratulations. I have a couple questions. Um, the first question relates to, um, it's for the public health officer, Davenport. Uh, Ms. Davenport, as you know, we received a few inquiries from residents as it relates to contact tracing. Um, there's confusion out there about whether or not this is happening anymore. And I think the answer to that question it is, well, it depends on the, on the type of test result that contact tracing triggers. Can you cover that a little bit? Sure, yeah. Okay, so um, let me first say that a couple of things happened, right? Um, unfortunately, concurrently, uh, we had a mask optional, right? We went mask optional in the state, and the state also said we're going to stop contact tracing. The only time we do not stop contact tracing and kick back up into um, some contact tracing case investigation in a more robust way is when we have an outbreak. The only way that we can determine an outbreak, as I mentioned before, is if we have a lab confirmed test. So those PCRs or those rapid antigen tests that go to a lab are sent directly to the health department. And from there, we can make a confirmatory um, determination. Any cases that are reported uh, from a home test can be reported to the health department, just the home test. You don't have to report a PCR, please. Um, or a rapid antigen lab test, just the home test. If you can tell us, um, you know, you tested positive on a home test, um, we will put that into the uh, system for the state that will trigger a case investigator to reach out to you and do that case investigation that we were doing with every case um, that we had uh, prior to the stop of our contact tracing. And they help us to get all of that information. The other thing about an, um, an outbreak um, that goes into it, aside from the lab test, is that we need to determine if this was happening inside that facility or setting. Perhaps you have two cases that were not linked to each other. One came in from spring break, one came in from an after school activity. They weren't connected to one another, so they didn't happen in that uh, classroom or setting or whatnot but it takes time to get that interview, right? It takes time to get that interview, get the information, figure it out. Once we have three cases that are epidemiologically linked and happen within that time frame when a disease like COVID can spread, which is within 48 hours, then we can de declare an outbreak. At that point, we provide guidance um, to put on masks, get people tested and um, move on from there. And then we monitor. I hope that helps. It does help. And I think my follow-up relates uh, to that as well, which is um, how are we getting the message out there to adults and to our students in the school that um, 
they should have a PCR test if they've tested positive for a home test so that we can track such an outbreak. Right. So we have, um, you know, as we are moving into this period and we're trying to figure out, we have to just figure out the process, right? We're, we're making it up as we go because we didn't see things coming. We didn't realize that, you know, these communications needed to happen. So we have now um, ironed that out and we've um, mentioned to the school and the school nurses and they know to inform people that when they get a notification of a student who is positive with a home test, the nurses now tell them to get a PCR test. Once we get a PCR test, we can then begin to link that. So it really helps us out a lot. The second thing is that we've told the school to inform um, the families to write into a Google form if they have a positive home test. Our public health nurse, Anna Markarova, receives those, and then that helps us to uh, collect the data. Thank you. I have nothing further, Chair McGee. Thank you. Uh, does any of my other colleagues like to address the Board of Health? Seeing no one, I will now open up uh, the floor to the public to um, ask any question of the Board of Health. Mr. Walls. If anybody would like to address the Board of Health, please use the raise your hand function. We'll convert you a panelist and allow you three minutes to speak. Mr. McGee, first up we have Kathleen Mitchell. We'll convert you to a panelist and allow you three minutes to address the Board of Health. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, we can, welcome. Great, um, I wanted to thank um, Ms. Davenport for recommending that Clinton School temporarily return to universal masking in the face of a surge of COVID cases that has impacted an alarming number of children and their families. I hope that the health department will consider extending this requirement for more than four days and proactively implementing a similar requirement at other schools before uncontrolled spread reaches the crisis proportions it has at Clinton. Um, additionally, New Jersey Department of Health advises that local health departments and school districts should consider a number of factors in determining whether it's safe to be mask optional. These include physical distancing, student screening, adequate ventilation, vaccination rates, effective contact tracing, and ability to appropriately exclude individuals with COVID. In our district, we have no physical distancing, no screening of students, and mediocre ventilation, especially in schools with construction where windows remain closed. Contact tracing is currently not happening except during an outbreak, which seems to be parent driven and not timely. Given these factors, is it your continued recommendation that it is safe for district schools to remain mask optional at this time? Additionally, Dr. Taylor has stated repeatedly that in a mask optional setting, everyone in the building is a close contact and that it would be disingenuous to notify students in a particular class Yet the New Jersey Department of Health guidance, as far as I can see, continues to define a close contact as someone within six feet for 15 minutes or more during a 24 hour period and continues to instruct that schools be responsible for notifying parents of close contact exposure. Can you explain why district policy is in conflict with the guidance from the New Jersey Department of Health? And is it your recommendation that the district staff no longer notify close contacts? Um, one more question, um, if I have time. South Orange Maple School District guidance calls for masks to be strongly recommended in large group gatherings and yet at assemblies and large indoor recesses with 100 plus students, masks are not even being mentioned. So I'm curious as to, to know during what type and size of in-school large group gathering would you recommend that masks be recommended or required? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. Uh, before you leave, uh, Ms. Davenport, did you get those questions? There were several, so I wanna make sure we have them. Um, I'm going to try to work my way backward. Mm -hmm. so. no. Okay, Ms. Mitchell, stay right there. Let's make sure we got these questions. Thank you. All right, so thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, let me start with um, assemblies. So the guidance is that whenever you have a large assembly gathering, going into the auditorium, right, for an assembly, we would recommend masking um, because you don't know where people are coming from. So when we have these performances that are coming and people are coming from different places, it's not just our school or our classes, um, we, would, we would recommend masking. 
Um, then you also mentioned, I'm so sorry, like there were a lot of questions. Um, I do wanna say that the reason why the school district no longer is able to do that robust case investigation and contact tracing um, or notification of contacts is because they no longer do contact tracing, right? Um, they no longer do contact tracing because we went mask optional. Um, by going mask optional, it changed the ball game, right? It changed the field in terms of how we can keep track of all of these cases. Um, and so we went mask optional, our vaccination rates in the community were good. So we thought it would be good to go mask optional and give people that option. Um, but that's why they are not able to do that. This is why when we have an outbreak, we are able to pull back and we have to you know, collect all of that information again. Yes. Yes, it requires people reporting. Yes, it requires people taking the responsibility for the onus after two years of being in a pandemic. The rules of the, of the game have not changed in terms of our responsibilities for, um, for COVID mitigation strategies, right? So I wanna end with mask optional does not mean mask less. And I'll say that one more time, mask optional does not mean mask less we are now given the opportunity and the choice to decide when it is appropriate to mask or not mask, right? Gauging the, 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 the events that are happening in the community. As for us, we are responsible to help prevent the spread. And then when we see an outbreak, try to control this as best as possible. So that is our job. Um, we, we might not do it perfectly, but we're doing the best that we can to try to control this. And hopefully with the help of the community, um, we, with reporting and with masking and with social distancing and with gauging if, is this event something that I need to go to or not? Um, is this a large gathering or not? Am I vaccinated or not? Um, these are things that we need the help of the community to help us control the spread. So I hope that that helps a little bit. If I can just clarify one thing, I think there's a lot of confusion in the community as to why going mask optional and contract tracing have been linked. Because for example, the way that Dr. Taylor has explained it to the community, like he is saying that a child, if there's a child with COVID in one classroom, that my child who is also in that classroom has the same risk as a child in another classroom on another floor of the building. And so to so I think there's a lot of misunderstanding in terms of families not 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 being clear about that. And I don't think we could speak for Dr. Taylor here. Um, so duly noted, but I think what we can do is follow up with with the school district to get more clarification for that, Ms. Mitchell. So we have to move on. I appreciate your questions, but we have several people online, and and uh, the mayor wants this to be done by 9:30. So that's going to be daunting, I think, at this point. Uh, so here, can we move uh, on to? Uh, Mr. Waltz, Ms. Kaplan, please. Thank you. Next, we have Daniel Kaplan. I convert you to a panelist and allow you three minutes to speak. And Mr. Okay. Kaplan, if you could please provide your uh, full name and address for the committee, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, sure. Uh, Daniel Kaplan, uh, address is 14 Salter Place in Maplewood. I'm good to go. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, Ms. Davenport, thank you. Uh, I think you've, you've addressed a bit of some of the questions I was going to ask. Um, I'm actually a, a parent of a, a Marshall student, which I know does not fall under the Maplewood Department of Health's authority. Um, so one question is, you know, given that the local departments of health are able to mandate uh, COVID mitigations to the district, does the Maplewood Department of Health and South Orange Department of Health equally share in the ability to impose a mandate on the district as a whole, or is it done school by school? Um, and additionally, um, given that, you know, I, I understand your, your comment that, you know, only lab tests can be utilized uh, to consider an outbreak, um, I've been made aware just in the past 24 hours um, of outbreaks in multiple kindergarten classes at the Marshall School where there are home tests. Um, and so there is rising concern from the parents uh, that nothing is able to be done because all we get from the school are these generic notification of positive cases. 
Um, so I think to kind of tag along with what Kathleen had said previously, you know, why, why isn't at least a, a basic minimum that we can do is, is notify the parents of a, of a, a classmate who you know tested positive, even if you're not doing full-on contact tracing, uh, I just think it would ease a lot of people's apprehensions uh, of what's going on lately, where we get positive notifications every day, every other day, multiple notifications, but there's no information behind it, so they're almost useless. Um, so, if you could comment on, on either of those, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Um... As uh, my board of health chair and the mayor have mentioned, when it comes to school communications, we can um, you know, comment on that, but we will work with them if there's clarification that needs to be had in terms of public health recommendations, but in terms of the communication aspect um, that you'll have to take up with the board of ed. In terms of um, Marshall School, correct. Marshall does not fall under my jurisdiction, um, but in terms of mandating, um, we are trying to, since we are, you know, not in, um, we're trying to move out of a pandemic, right? So the ability to mandate um, is kind of moving away from that. However, mandating like across the board with a hammer is not what we're able to do. What we wanna do is refine that so that if there are issues in a specific area, we will recommend um, going back to masking for a little bit so that we can control the bleeding essentially stop the spread, control it and move on, right? So um, again, we don't mandate to the school district unless that's you know recommended to us from the state. Um, we will take it by, as a school by school, class by class basis. That's what we can do um, at this point. Um, I think that was um, most of the questions that I think you had. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I mean, the only, the only other thing to add, um, to the point of mask optional and, and the point that, you know, the community needs to take responsibility. Um, I 100% agree with that. However, I do feel that unless something is mandatory, people are tired of masking and they just don't want to do it anymore. And, to, and for the majority of people, it feels like mask optional means I don't need to wear a mask anymore. And so I don't know if that's just something that there needs to be better communication, better education of people to say that Mask optional does not mean everyone stop masking. Um, I think my daughter is one of two children in her class that still masks. Um, and it just, it feels like everyone just wants to be done with COVID and COVID is not done with it, with everyone. And Mr. Um, Kaplan, again, thank you also for your comments. I think, you know, what we would advise the Board of Health is that if, if there's any questions that you want us to to share in a collaborative matter with the Board of Health, we're happy to do that. If you send us an email, just I just want to just communicate again that like you know these are situations that are really you know Board of Health, uh, I mean, um, Board of Ed uh, centric. So we really can't you know comment on what Dr. Taylor said or allegedly said or, or what he's doing, but we can you know listen to the question you have, facilitate a conversation uh, you know with uh, Dr. Taylor administration, and then go from there and, and, and even discuss as a follow-up in the next Board of Health meeting. So thank you for your time, sir. Appreciate it. We're going to move on, uh, uh, Mr. Waltz. Thank you. Okay, Mr. McGehee, next up we have Mary Barman. We'll convert to a panelist and allow you three minutes to speak. Please just provide your full name and address to the committee before addressing them. Thank you. Hi, good evening. You can hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Fabulous. Um, I don't want to take too much of your time. Uh, I have heard from a number of Clinton parents. I'm, As you know, I write for Village Green. And uh, I just wanted to clarify, uh, uh, Candace, you had answered some of my emails last week and said there was not an outbreak at Clinton School at that time because we had a lot of rapid tests, but not PCR results. So at this time, do you have more PCR results? for Clinton students and as is there an outbreak at Clinton School? So we have uh, lab tests and we have linked them. And there are three cases, uh, three classes that I believe that we are following um, because they have more than three um, kids in that classroom that are positive. Um, so that would be considered quote unquote an outbreak, right? For those classrooms. And we're still monitoring the rest of them to see what data we can, we can find. Is the whole school an outbreak setting? No. Would I say that, you know, Clinton school, as you mentioned, um, needs to 
be careful and mask up and, you know, watch their activities and try to maintain social distancing and practice those things. Um, yes, this is where we're going to do this ebb and flow of, of, you know, activities that we need to do. It's not end of COVID, everything's done. It's we adjust to what we have. So Clinton will have to morph just like Columbia High School did, just like Psalms did when they had their outbreaks after their musicals. So, um, and then- and, uh, I think I'm so sorry. Ms. Mitchell had mentioned, uh, it sounded like she said that there was now a, a indoor mask mandate reinstituted for four days at Clinton, or did I mishear that? That is correct. Now that we have um, data and we have outbreaks, we have recommended to the school district to uh, mask up at Clinton for the next five days as is standard protocol by CDC and the State Health Department. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and again, any questions, you can also email the Board of Health, Ms. Davenport and myself, and we will follow up with the Board of Ed, um, just, just for everyone's education. So, Mr. Waltz, who do we have next? Mr. McGeehee, next up we have Liam Stapleton. I apologize if I've mispronounced your name. Uh, we'll converse to a panelist, allow you three minutes to speak. Please provide your full name and address before addressing the committee. We're ready. Hi, okay, sorry. Uh, my name is Lena Stapleton. My address is 21 Marie Place, Maplewood. I am a school district parent and I have some comments and questions. I agree with Mr. Kaplan. When you say mask optional does not mean mask less. When you're considering children and peer pressure, optional does mean mask less. When they see their peers not wearing masks, they lose that option. And we as adults need to be responsible for taking care of their health and making these decisions for them. My first question, currently the school district extends virtual learning to students only on days zero through five of COVID and expects them to return to school on day six. Should students who are still testing positive on rapids be returning to school? And if so, what precautions should be taken to ensure that they don't infect others during unmasked activities such as lunch? My next question, New Jersey Department of Health recommends that students be kept in district cohorts, especially in unmasked environments such as lunch and that physical distancing be maximized. What is your recommendation on elementary school classes being allowed to mix freely at lunch with no distancing as we have seen? My last question, I appreciate the strain that your department must be under given the alarming rise in cases in our schools. New Jersey Department of Health allows for schools to temporarily transition specific cohorts to remote learning when a high number of cases prevents timely contact tracing. Given the lag time in contact tracing in our district, why have classes not been provided with any guidance or additional mitigation measures while outbreak investigations are being provided for that class. These could include mandatory masking, virtual options, HEPA filtration, CR boxes, rapid tests being sent home as New York City and other districts have done. Yet nothing is done here. And as those recent, these recent outbreaks show, that only allows the outbreak to in intensify and spread. So, Chair, Chair McGee, may yeah. I, a point of order, please, sir, yeah. if you and excuse me, excuse me, just a, just a minute, Ms. Stapleton, if you and Health Officer Davenport are okay with the following protocol, I suggest because these are really good questions and they're very substantive, um, that we provide an answer in writing after the meeting tonight. I'm putting uh, Health Officer Davenport's contact information here available to panelists and attendees, and we will follow up in writing afterward because these are very substantive questions that require uh, fulsome discussion and we're just not gonna get through everyone. We have other hands raised and we wanna uh, not do a disservice and we certainly do not wanna misinform. If you're okay with that, I think that's the protocol we should follow. Yeah, and, and I agree with that, uh, Mayor. I also think, you know, I, as we're having these conversations, I'm going to reach out to President Thayer 
Joshua after this call and ask that the Board of Ed uh, put health on their agenda for their next meeting. It's clear to me that they're lacking that right now because these are questions that really, although we do have a relationship with the Board of Ed, it sounds like there's a gap in their agenda in terms of addressing these questions and concerns of our residents here in Maplewood. So I'm going to also stress that they have a Board of Health session, COVID session in their next meeting uh, in May. Terrific. Yeah. So let's let Ms. Stapleton finish and then we'll and then we'll just move on from there. Ms. Okay. Stapleton, you have the floor. Okay. And I appreciate that that you will see to it that the Board of Ed makes this a priority. I do have concerns because we've seen them dismiss it in the past, but hopefully with your direction, they will take it more seriously. Well, I know that Ms. Mann from the Village Green is on this call, so she will gladly quote that in the Village Green for tomorrow that the Board of Health Chair is requested that the Board of Ed have a agenda item related to COVID situations in their May agenda. So I'm making that statement here in public, formally documented for the press as well. Okay, so the only last thing that I was going to say, I understand that you cannot speak for Dr. Taylor, but Dr. Taylor regularly states that he is following your guidance and his policies. And it seems as though the guidance may need to be made more strongly to him. Thank you. Ms. Davenport, uh, obviously we don't wanna discuss <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Taylor's interpretation of, of what guidance you provide to him, but that but that is that is duly noted. Uh, is there any of the, the three? I had three questions. Did any of those one of those questions you want to address before we move forward? There was a I question think, about. I think I'll follow with the mayor's lead, and um, if Ms. Stapleton can email me, I'll be happy to write back. You got it. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Davenport, and thank you, Ms. Stapleton, uh, for your questions here. I listed. All right. Uh, Yes, are, are we continuing with the public comment? Mayor, do you want to continue with the public comment if it's non-school related at this point? Yes, please continue with the public comment. We don't want to keep people out, but again, we will respond to questions uh, in writing. I think that's fair. People are reading their statements in writing um, and you know, we really cannot inform appropriately uh, in this short period of time. So let's continue with the public comment, but we're not going to engage in a back and forth. Agreed. All right. Well, Mr. Walsh, please continue. Okay, Mr. McGee, next up we have Heather Soslovsky. We'll converge to a panelist and allow you three minutes. Please provide your full name and address before addressing the committee. Thank you. Good evening. And I appreciate the fact that we'll get written responses. I hope that that's accurate. Um, I will read as fast as I can so you have all my questions and then I will email them to Ms. Davenport afterwards as well. So that it's very, very clear. And you don't have to take full notes. First, I would let you know that we've all been referred here. We've been referred here by the district. They specifically cite you and that we should come talk to you. So here we are, because that's what we have to do. And some of these questions have in fact been sent to you already. We don't always get responses. I wanna point out the district never did contact tracing, but did in fact alert classrooms. They no longer do that ever since they've gone mask optional. That is not what you just said. So you need to know what's actually accurate. You also noted that we should all be taking personal responsibility. I would like to know how, because if you won't tell us the number and simply send a plural notification, how do we know how many kids in our child's school have COVID? It's very different if individuals means two or means 45. We've seen a huge range over a period of time. We have no information and you cannot possibly say, I can take any personal responsibility for myself or my child unless you provide data. I saw the data you provided today. And it appears to me that our seven day running average has exponentially exploded since we have gone mask optional. As you know, these outbreaks are not being reported out and we are consistently told, including in writing, outbreaks are your responsibility. So they claim that the community will be told about outbreaks, but we have confirmed that aftercare providers, extracurricular activities, sports, the community at large, and wider school community have all not been informed even of the very first outbreak at Clinton. So what in fact is your department doing regarding public notification? You noted that assemblies should be masked. They have not been. They have not even been suggested to be masked despite the district claiming they strongly suggest large groups be masked. They have 
considered assemblies not to be large groups. Why are you not advising them? Next week, the Clinton show will gather. They will have hundreds together. The week after, MMS is holding chorus concerts. Chorus. We all know since the very beginning of this pandemic that singing creates more aerosols that go further. Why are you not advising them? I have the very flyer. Masks are not mentioned. Not once mentioned. Not suggested. Not implied. Not recommended. Certainly not strongly recommended. So I'd like to know what you're doing. I'd like to know who first alerted you to the Clinton kindergarten outbreak. Not specifically who, but was it parents, community members, or was it district personnel? Because I think it's important that we as a community know how you're getting your information and how those outbreak investigations are handled given how long it took and how quickly we've gone to many outbreaks. You've told a number of individuals about how to ensure the outbreaks are investigated. 10 seconds. You the public, you need to put out this information because saying it here is not sufficient. And I have a plenty of other questions that I will happily email you and I hope I will get a response. Mr. Waltz, who's next, please? Mr. McGeehee, we have uh, just a first name, uh, Adrian. Thank you. Ms. Davenport, I apologize for that uh, aggressive <laughs> uh, line of questioning by that resident. Uh, I don't think that was appropriate or fair to you. So I will I will just want to pro publicly communicate that my apologies if you were made uncomfortable in any way by those remarks. Thank you. I just want to remind everyone that May is Mental Health Month. Yes, <laughs> that's important. Thank you. Let's move forward. Hi, my name is Adrian, and I'm not sure if this public comment section is for non-Clinton school outbreak comments. So let me know before I start off. Please move forward. Uh, thank you. Okay. So first off, thanks to all the civil servants, you know, who put in the effort and the energy into this community. And I'm sure you don't hear that enough, but thank you all. Um, I wanted to bring to your attention the egregious driving behavior on Valley Street. I live on Valley in Tuscan, and since the return of traffic with post-pandemic life, Valley Street has proved to be dangerous for many pedestrians, especially the school children that cross this corner routinely. While I know this is a county road, it's from my understanding that it's 25 miles an hour, it is not designated truck route for 102 inch wide trucks and double trailers as outlined in the state laws. It's not, or it is covered under chapter 181-1 under the noise ordinance. And you should actually stop before turning right on red. In addition to the vehicular danger that could easily be curbed by enforcing basic laws, there is also the issue of air and noise pollution. I've spoken with many frustrated residents and subsequently had an Essex Regional Health Commission representative visit our home to conduct a noise audit. And I understand that traffic noise is exempt from the noise enforcement laws in New Jersey, but it's important to understand the impact these illegally traveling semis have on roadways unsuitable for their size and configuration. According to the noise enforcement laws and the EPA, commercial or industrial sources would need to be under 65 decibels during the day and 50 at night. The audit conducted at our property line reached 75 decibels consistently, which can cause measurable hearing damage among high blood pressure. 30 seconds. So modified engine noise. It would be helpful if the township would acknowledge the challenge its homeowners on living on Maplewood's primary roads and modify pertinent ordinances and regulations. Um, this ordinance fails to deal with the fact that most homes in Maplewood are well within 100 feet of the road. Additionally, setback requirements, for fences and walls outlined in 271-43 do not permit owners to place sound barriers nearest to the source of the noise. But well, I understand that transportation is necessary, a compromise, or at least the very least, an effort by law enforcement to start enforcing the laws that are already in place to make the streets safer while making it a pleasant Place for all the residents on Valley Street. Thank you. That timer is a real, <laughs> real motivator there. <laughs> you did excellent. I uh, before you before you leave the panelist side, I just e uh, sent you a, a message with my email address. If you can send me a note with that information, I will um, convert that more to our public safety. I'm the chair of public safety. And then also I see Ms. Adams too, but I'll take it from a public safety and I'll, I'll talk to the chief about that. 
because it's kind of like not board health per se, but somewhat board health. So yeah, it's, it's a hybrid question. So yeah. I'll, I'll take it and Nancy will take it as well. But I do want to talk to the chief about Yeah, talk well. about so, enforcement. I'll talk about the ordinance. Yeah, exactly. So we'll tag team it. Uh, but thank you for your comments. And again, um, stay here as a panelist. So you can take down my email address and we'll move on to, uh, to the next uh, question. Mr. Waltz. Uh, just one point of order again, Chair McGeehy. Uh, we're gonna stop the public comment with Ms. Shen um, and uh, Dr. White can join us at the second public comment period that we have coming up. Uh, so we're gonna stop the public comment period for BOH with Ms. Shen, thank you. No, no worries, Mayor, I appreciate that. I don't think that 930 over under is gonna work tonight. <laughs> Mr. McGee, right. next we have Kathleen Freyd Stern, a virtual panelist, I have three minutes to speak. You're currently muted. Hi, uh, my name is Kathleen Freight Stern. I live at 12 Gerard Place in Maplewood. I have um, a child at MMS in seventh grade, um, a child in fifth grade at Tuscan, they're watching me, um, and a child in kindergarten at Tuscan, and then another child who will be starting hopefully in the fall um, in preschool. I am, my question is for Ms. Davenport. Um, the Department of Education guidance has said that they're supposed to work in close conjunction with the Department of Health, local agencies. Um, so my question is just, who do you work with from the Department of Education, from SOMSD? So you said you said um, that you recommended that Clinton mask up, right? Who did you tell that to? I wanna know who you, are in communication with at the Department of Education, who is like a liaison who's working with you to address these issues because we've been directed to you. But if there's somebody at the DOE that um, we should be talking to instead or that informs you of certain things, I just wanna know who that person is, who your contact is, who you report to at the DOE or yeah, the SOMSD. That's we will it. follow up in writing. We will follow up in writing with that information. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McGee, next we have Ruzen Shen. Convert you to a panelist, allow you three minutes to speak. Hi, everyone. I'm back. Um, so I just first want to say that I um, I want to thank you, Ms. Davenport, for your hard work, and and thank you um, everybody for, who served on the board of uh, health for uh, navigating the COVID situation because it's not easy because none of us has ever dealt with it. Um, that said, I also not to like my I have a four year old who's in a preschool that has recently got mask optional as well. Uh, Knocks on knock on wood that so far there hasn't been an outbreak in these class, but we'll see. I think it's about time. Um, it's about a matter of time. So what I wanted to say is, would would the um, township, um, would the board of education, not sorry, the of uh, health, consider reinstate the mask mandate for town? I, I know that I, I don't want to talk about Clinton. That's, that's not my problem for now. Because um, I'll give you an example. Last weekend, I was in town in, in, in a village and I was in some small shop uh, that had, I don't know, 10 kids uh, under seven and nobody was masked. And it was a terrifying sight to me. Um, and then I mean, just all I could think about is, you know, how many of them might have COVID and how many of them could spread to other people. And the uh, same day I was at a local uh, bakery and there's a table of uh, people who were singing happy birthday without obviously no mask on. So again, um, I was just hoping that maybe um, the board would reconsider a mask mandate. Because uh, if you look at data, it is obviously alarming. And if you, if obviously the CDC has not made it very easy uh, 
to for everybody to, for the public or or uh, officials uh, health, public health officials to understand what's going on in the country and in our counties so if you look at the cdc map this community level is uh, everything's great and if you look at the local transmission levels everything's horrible so it, it's it's really seconds. hard to navigate and I just wanted to see if uh, there's a possibility for the township to um, reconsider mass mandate. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Davenport, do you just want to briefly touch on that question? Uh, I'll respond um, via email to uh, Ms. Shen. Um, I think the mayor put my email address in the chat, so. Noted, duly noted. Thank you, Ms. Davenport. Okay, uh, per, uh, per direction, we will close our public comment uh, for this time and for this meeting. Uh, at this point, I will now an address uh, or entertain a motion to adjourn Moved. our main public health meeting. So may I get a motion, please? Moved. May I get a second, please? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Fritzen, please call the roll. Ms. Adams? Yes. Mayor Daffis? Yes. Mr. DeLuca? Yes. Mr. McGee? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Fritzen. And Mayor, I left you not much wiggle room for 24 minutes. Thank you, Chair McGee. Uh, well done under very um, tough circumstances, tough circumstances. I felt like we were in a BOE meeting tonight. Um, so we have some work to do. All right. This brings us to the introduction of a couple of ordinances we have here. Ms. Mayor, item number nine, we have a uh, introduction of new ordinance. Ordinance 3059-22 is an ordinance authorizing and encouraging electric vehicle supply service equipment, EVSE, and make ready parking spaces. This ordinance set forth procedures for the installation of electric vehicle supply service equipment, EVSE, and make ready parking spaces and establishes associated regulations and other standards. Uh, yeah, I move the passage of this ordinance on first reading its publication according to law in the Maplewood South Orange News Record and a hearing to be held on May 17th. Second. <clears throat> so Adams? Yes. Ms. Kripe? Mr. DeLuca? Yes. Mr. McGeehee? Yes. Mayor Daffis? Yes. Introduction of bond ordinance number 3060-22. Yes, uh, Mayor, 3060-22. 30, uh, 30, bond ordinance providing for various capital improvements in and by the Township of Maplewood in the County of Essex, New Jersey, appropriating the aggregate amount of $6,986,100, therefore, and authoring, authorizing the issuance of $6,668,895 in bonds or notes of the township to finance part of the cost thereof. I move the passage of this ordinance on its first reading, its publication according to law in the Maplewood South Orange News Record, and a hearing to be held on May 17th, 2022. I'll second 360 6022. Ms. Adams? Yes. Ms. Kripe? Mr. DeLuca? Yes. Mr. McGeehee? Yes. Mayor Daffis? Yes. Next mayor is Bond Ordinance 3061 22, also an introduction. Bond Ordinance providing for environmental abatement in and by the Township of Maplewood in the County of Essex, New Jersey, appropriating $1 million, including $560,000 proceeds of obligations not needed for their original purposes and $22,000 from the Capital Improvement Fund and authorizing the issuance of $418,000 in bonds or notes to the Township to finance part of the cost thereof. Ms. Fritzen, correction, that's 3062-22. I move the passage of this ordinance on first reading its publication according to law in the Maplewood South Orange News Record and a hearing to be held on May 17th, 2022. And I'll second on ordinance. Ms. Adams? Yes. Ms. Kripe? Not here. Mr. DeLuca? 
Yes. Mr. McGee. Yes. Mayor Daffis. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Fritzen. And that concludes our introduction of ordinances this evening. Moving on to reports from departments. I don't believe we have a department reporting or presenting this evening. So that takes us to administrative reports and we'll start with Township Administrator Drives. Mayor, I think you have one more bond ordinance uh, about the uh, pool utility. I thought that was the one that we just did, no? No. Oh. So this one is 3062. Right. Okay. Uh, on introduction, Mayor. Uh, bond ordinance providing for improvements to the pool utility in and by the Township of Maplewood in the County of Essex, New Jersey, appropriating $252,000, therefore, and authorizing the issuance of $239,400 in bonds or notes to the Township to finance the cost thereof. I move the passage of this ordinance on first reading. It's publication according to law in Maple with South Orange news record and a hearing to be held on May 17th, 2022. And I stand corrected as well, Ms. Fritzen. Sorry about that. No worries. I'll second this bond ordinance. Ms. Adams. Yes. Ms. Cripe. Mr. DeLuca. Yes. Mr. McGeehee. Yes. Mayor Daffis. Yes, thanks again. Township Administrator Drimes, your report, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a couple quick updates on the personnel standpoint. Um, as you see from your agenda, we're hiring, or we're changing one of the positions from part-time to full-time, and that is a resolution that was pulled from the agenda a few meetings ago, and it's back on for tonight. That's a grant-funded position in the health department for a general administrative assistant. Secondly, as you see, we are uh, hiring an events coordinator here to replace a vacancy that occurred a few months back. Um, so we're happy to have that uh, process to be moving forward. And lastly, from a personnel standpoint, as it relates to tonight agenda, tonight's agenda, we are hiring a um, someone to oversee the summer lunch program that's going to take place from July till August. That's a partnership with the Board of Ed, and we'll be building the Board of Ed for that service. Um, as it relates to the bond ordinances that were just approved, um, now is about the time where we start to mobilize in anticipation of their final passage to get ready logistically, you know, from a management and a procurement standpoint to um, get those projects up and running. So once they're final approved, we'll work with all the department heads to get ready um, to move those forward. As you know, um, many of those take time, but we will move as expeditiously and as efficiently as possible. Um, you received today from the township attorney, I believe, the final rankings for our last set of cannabis um, applicants that will be on the agenda for, I believe, the next meeting. Um, they were reviewed by the Cannabis Committee and we'll forward to you this afternoon. And lastly, uh, uh, it'll probably come up in Mr. DeLuca's reports, but we're working on the doing business with the township is coming up uh, Thursday the 5th, and that's going to be in person and Zoom um, with department heads, uh, the assistant administrator, myself, and members of the Township Committee, if you so choose to attend. You know, you're certainly welcome. Um, with that, that's all I have for tonight. So I don't know if you have any questions. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Jimes. Any questions for Mr. Jimes? No questions. Seeing none, we're gonna move to uh, Assistant Administrator Barnett. I believe that Administrator Jimes covered all of the main events and main points that I would have brought up. So I'll keep it nice and short today and um, wave my report. <laughs> thank you so much. I always wanna give you the opportunity, it's important. Township Attorney Desiderio. I have no report, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Desiderio. Township Clerk Fritzen. Hey, uh, Mayor, just a, a few things and I'll make it brief. Um, so in the course of the last week and a half, uh, we've uh, conducted uh, six event planning meetings for large scale events that'll be uh, going on in our township. Uh, one being uh, Maple Woodstock and uh, Green Day, which has uh, already been held on April 23rd. Uh, we're also uh, finalizing an election piece, which uh, we've been uh, putting out for primary and general elections in the last several years uh, for the uh, June 7th primary election. So that um, piece is almost ready uh, for uh, distribution. And I'll show that to the Township Committee uh, beforehand. And yes, to Memorial Day Parade. So we're working on a parade. Uh, 
we've been having uh, uh, ceremonies, but we haven't had a parade uh, since COVID. So um, uh, email blasts will be going out probably tomorrow with uh, some information. Um, and also I'll use my email address for uh, groups to contact me uh, that uh, they want to march. We already have the uh, Boy Scouts engaged, the uh, Columbia High School Band, uh, the Maplewood Township Committee to march. And uh, we will be seeking, uh, you know, the participation of Maplewood's uh, veterans as well. And uh, Girl Scouts, baseball teams, um, everyone's welcome to get back into uh, what we've had in the past. And uh, again, uh, email blasts to go out tomorrow. And uh, that's all that I have, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ritzin. Any questions for our township clerk? We know that Ms. Kripe's not here, right? Oh, <laughs> uh, really? I didn't. Um, Ms. Adams, I'm just calling <laughs> Ms. Kripe's name because I don't know when she's going to reappear. Yes, we, we. I figured I was just busting your chops. Mayor, I have a question for Mr. Desiderio. Sure. Uh, Mr. Desiderio, the ordinance we passed on the um, electric vehicle charging stations, does that have to go to the planning board? Yeah, I'd already, uh, yes, I've already sent a copy to Ms. Lewis, so she's aware of it and it will go on their agenda. Yes, sir. Great. Thank you. Okay, reports from elected officials, committee member McGee. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I'll touch, I'll be quick, but I have uh, four or five things we need to discuss. First, uh, the South Essex Fire Department, as you know, we have now are, are, are in the process of becoming official, but we are operational from the standpoint that we're having weekly standing meetings, uh, inclusive of committee members, which is myself, uh, President Collin from South Orange, and former Township Committee member Greg Limbrick. We, Mr. DeLuca, as well as Mr. Brown, are also alternate members. We have several working groups. Uh, we're working on inspections, inventory, branding and logos, our EMT plan, and also our transitional plan because uh, we'll be looking to really start July 1st. Uh, and then also we're just forming out some of the responsibilities of some of the committee members moving forward. Um, like I said, we're meeting every week. Uh, these are ongoing conversations. Uh, we're also working very closely with the DCA down in Trenton, and we are working with the highest uh, ranking officials in the state of New Jersey, literally, uh, meeting with some of them, in fact, as well, uh, and more to come. We'll also be looking at dispatch communications, um, also the hiring process, uh, which happens when you merge two departments, uh, and then just our watching transitional plan. So again, uh, we have a meeting this Friday uh, with Lieutenant Governor, and we have more meetings coming up every week, and that's pretty much all things are right now with, for the South Essex Fire Department. Uh, the next committee I wanna discuss is communications. Uh, as you know, Ms. Bailey did an amazing job to, to share and do a presentation regarding our, our website last week. Uh, we're now moving into what we're calling our PR and awareness campaign. So uh, in the weeks ahead, uh, we've already reached out to tap into, uh, we'll be reaching out to uh, the Village Green or continue to have conversations with Village Green. We really wanna get our public to move off of social media and really uh, come to our website. Uh, where will be a source of information, our central uh, source of information. For those who haven't signed up already, we're sitting on weekly Friday communications, all things happening uh, in the township of Maplewood, both socially and also in terms of process and operations. And I highly recommend going to our website and sign to get those email communications as well. Finally, also on the communications committee, again, shout out to, uh, to, to Ms. Barnett, who worked to get our boards and committee update fixed. So if you do decide you want to uh, express interest in a board or committee, you can go to our website and it's a seamless process to get your information to the township. Um, the other thing I wanna to touch on is uh, on Wednesday, uh, May 18th, we'll be having a Haitian Heritage Month flag racing here in the township of Maplewood, just like we've done for transgender and for other events. Uh, we started this back when I was mayor and we wanna continue that tradition so please come out, uh, that'll be at uh, 5 p.m. Um, at Town Hall, where we'll be raising uh, the Haitian flag for Haitian Heritage Month. And then uh, a couple quick things. Uh, the Master Plan Committee had a robust meeting uh, in April. Uh, per the consultant, which we hired, we'll be meeting in early June with next steps. And from there, we will roll out communication to the public on how they can get involved in the process. And then finally, I'm working on trying to get our uh, task force for field conditions, as well as for field prioritization up and running. It's been a daunting task as the department heads associated with these task force have been very busy. 
uh, with spring and with the uh, evolvement now of, of baseball and, and softball and sports and other things related to our fields. So with that, I yield the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Committee Member uh, Mikihi. Committee Member Adams. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm happy to announce tonight that on April 25th, the Maplewood Village Historic District was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Finally, um, I want to particularly thank Susan New Newberry, who is instrumental in obtaining this important designation and has been working on it for years. HPC will be working on getting the official plaques and we'll do with the, with the township and um, We'll probably do some sort of celebration or ribbon cutting in the coming months. So far, in addition to those installations of appropriate signage and exhibit on the village is in the planning works um, by Duran Hedden for November and as its contribution to the 100th anniversary of the naming of the township of Maplewood. So congrats to Susan and HPC on getting this designation. Um, it's no mo May, just to let you know if uh, you want to try to make part of your lawn, a section of your lawn, or all of your lawn, um, a habitat for bees and other pollinators, please uh, join the No Mo May movement. I'm working with Green Team Chair um, Tracy Woods on updating our plastic bag ordinance so that it's not in conflict with the new state statute. And we'll talk about it at code committee. Ms. Barnett, could you add that to the agenda? Thank you. And I'm reminding residents to ask that when you get takeout, your favorite restaurants not to automatically include condiment packets and single use utensils, things you don't need, especially if you're eating at home, hopefully. Um, at Code, we discussed the Maplewood Village Alliance. Um, we've asked the Maplewood Village Alliance to discuss and vote on their recommendation to us on the Township Committee with regard to allowing streeteries and parklets going forward after 2022. Um, we will then work on a small subcommittee with a couple members of MVA's design committee to come up with design regulations and make recommendations to this body. And lastly, I can't end my report without commenting on the leaked draft decision by the Supreme Court on Roe v. Wade. I was a sophomore in high school when the right for women to decide whether or not to carry a pregnancy to term was decided and became law. And now almost 50 years later, to be on the brink of going backwards to make abortion illegal is frankly infuriating. Um, I'm incredibly grateful to our Assemblywoman, Myla Jacy for sponsoring, co-sponsoring a bill at the state level that our governor, Phil Murphy, signed into law, protecting women in New Jersey's right to determine their own health care choices so that this absurd ruling, should it happen on a national level, can't hurt women in the state of New Jersey but this is a dangerous and yet another attack on women in this country. Um, it will result in the deaths of women all over this country, just like used to happen before 1973. We all know that this will mostly impact people who don't have the resources to afford the luxury of traveling to safe states when they need women's health services and particularly abortion. So here we go back again to the unfair impact of on women of lower income. The anti-choice conservatives in elected office and on the court want to control and protect the unborn, but couldn't care less about them once they're born. And then blame people who had no choice but to carry those babies to term that they can't afford because they had no choice. So don't get me started on many states that are blanketly making abortion illegal, even for case, cases of rape and incest. It's just flatly disgusting. So I won't ramble on because it raises my blood pressure as the news did late last night when it was breaking. I marched on Washington to protect women's right to choose. I've written my elected representatives. I urge everyone to do the same. Even our left-wing liberal representatives need to hear about it. They need the support of the community to fight this and to make it codify it in the law of this country so that we don't, it can't get overturned again. Um, so it's times like these, I'm very proud to be a Democrat with a big, large D and uh, keep working for the rights of, of women in this country. Thanks, Mayor, that's all I have. Thank you, and well said. Deputy Mayor DeLuca. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I wanna compliment Ms. Adams for those comments. Um, 
I agree with them wholeheartedly. I spent 25 years at the Jesse Smith Noise Foundation. We funded reproductive rights and health uh, work around the country here and in Latin America and South America. Um, and it's just it's just staggering what's what's happening here, and um, it really has to. We really have to to build back, you know, from the ground up again, uh, and win this. Um, I just want to talk three things real quick because I know we're we're running out of time. Uh, as was mentioned by Mr. Jimes, we have uh, this Thursday doing business with the township. We got two sessions, one in person, so come by. You will meet this, uh, the department heads. You'll have an opportunity to, to network with them and then by Zoom. Uh, and the mayor will be at both giving a welcome and participating. And um, uh, Mr. Jimes and Ms. Barnett will be talking about uh, the township's uh, policies and how we maneuver and all that. So again, it's Thursday. We have an in-person session, nine to 10 and by Zoom. And you can go on our website and there was an email blast that went out today um, to let people know. So um, the next thing I wanted to say is that Mayfest is back on Sunday, May 15th, uh, 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Springfield Avenue between uh, Indiana Street and Rutgers. So come on up. Uh, hopefully it'll be a beautiful day and uh, it'll be nice to um, get out there again the, in the, on Springfield Avenue for Mayfest. We haven't had it for a few years. And lastly, on the same day, um, we have the uh, Holocaust Remembrance Service, uh, which is happening at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. We are doing our March of Remembrance. We'll be in South Orange this year at Spiota Park, and we'll be walking to uh, the uh, congregation over at 170 Scotland Road, and at 4 p.m. there'll be the Remembrance Service. So here we have a speaker and uh, different people that we're honoring. So again, that is uh, the, it is, uh, it's, we've been doing this for over 40 years in uh, one year in South Orange, another year in Maplewood. Uh, this year it'll be in South Orange again. It's Sunday, May 15th. We have a march at 3 p.m. and a service at 4 p.m. And that's it, Mayor, thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Toluca. Uh, Acknowledging that committee member Cripe is still in transit and unavailable, uh, I will conclude our elected officials report. First, I wanna make a motion to extend our session beyond 9.30. Do I have a second? I'll second it. And we have failed in our first attempt to shorten our township committee meeting, but I am persistent and we will carry on with this. Um, we just have to continue being more efficient and not, and not allowing people to um, interrogate or rant. We are here to, add, to inform, we are here to engage, we are here to build, we are here to care, but we are not here to dismantle. Mayor, so, do we need to vote on that? Yeah, yeah. I think we need to take a vote. Ms. Adams? Yes. It's not, it's, it's not in the bylaws. You, you yeah. really don't need to vote we on don't it. Need to vote. I think we said last time, okay. Well, last time we said we were going to vote to actually affirmatively go beyond 930. Okay. Oh, okay, go, yes. <laughs> Ms. Craig, Mr. Luca. Yes. Ms. McGeehee. Yes. Mayor Daffis. Yes, thank you, Ms. Fritzen. So, you know, as Ms. Adams said, uh, the news coming out of the Supreme Court in the last 24 hours is absolutely alarming. And speaking of dismantling, it is truly the dismantling of our democracy because first they start with women's rights and reproductive rights in particular, then they will carry on with same sex rights and LGBTQ equality um, until they completely dismantle our democracy. We are talking about well-established rights well-established rights that the majority of public op opinion is in favor of. So who are they doing this for? If you're outraged and you should be, take action. Don't leave it on Facebook. Do something about it. And the thing that you could do about it is to engage in the midterms. We have midterms coming up. We need to ensure our majority in the House of Representatives and New Jersey our delegation, our congressional delegation is in the front lines of that. 
Come out and meet them tomorrow night at five o'clock in Maplewood Village. To those of you who thought that that was inappropriate, I'm sorry. We are losing our democracy. You join us tomorrow night at five o'clock in the center, in our economic center, where commerce meets community on the streets. So we can fight back because we have gotten comfortable. We have not kept our eyes on the target. The other side has, and that's why we are where we are. The only other thing I have to comment on is that we were going to introduce our budget tonight and obviously that's not happening. Um, we've been advised from our CFO that he is still working with our auditor to pull together the annual financial statement, which is a requirement to introduce our budget. We will be introducing our budget in June. With that, can I get a motion on the consent agenda and the minutes? Mayor, I will move uh, consent agenda items A through uh, M, which is resolution number 123-22, concluding with resolution number 156-22. Second. Sams. Yes. Stripe. Mr. Luca. Yes. Mr. McGee. Yes. Mayor Daffis. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Fritzen. This brings us to our second public comment period. Mayor, we need to do the, the minutes. Oh, I thought we included the minutes. That's what I asked a motion for. No, I went through uh, M. I didn't go through O. I usually go. Go ahead. No worries. Can we get a motion for the minutes? Move um, them for uh, regular session, December 7th, closed session, April 19th. Second. Sams? Yes. Ms. Cripe? Mr. Dulica? Yes. Mr. McGee? Yes. Mayor Daffis? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Fritzen. Uh, we're moving over to public comment, second period, and I believe Dr. White's been waiting patiently all this time. Good evening, Mayor and Township Committee. We'll now begin the second public comment portion of the meeting on any subject matter. If you would like to address the Township Committee, please use the raise your hand function as a virtue of panelists and allow you three minutes to speak. First up, we have Khadija White. Hi. Um, yeah, I waited. I, I have slight concerns about uh, just First Amendment issues in terms of getting moved to the second part because I actually was interested in the <laughs> the Department of Health meeting, that's the one I raised my hand to speak in. Um, but uh, but I think she's no longer here. So I guess I'll just state it for the record. So there's two things. Um, one, I was hoping that, um, that she could speak to uh, the issue of water safety. And obviously I, I'm concerned about the pool. I have a son who uh, has autism. Um, kids with autism are much more likely to drown than other kids. Uh, and it seems like, I mean, just given the silence of most of the township committee, when I brought this up, um, Mr. DeLuca did not speak, Ms. Adams did not speak, Mr. McGee, he did not speak. Um, the fact that there's so much silence around this issue to me tells me that the township committee doesn't maybe understand that this is a safety and health issue. And so I had wanted to raise that to Ms. Davenport to ask if the Department of Health was weighing in or advising in any way in this capacity around this issue. Um, the second thing was that she had mentioned that one of the schools, Clinton, had been uh, instructed and mandated to mask for five days. They're only being mandated to mask for four days. Um, and so there seems to be some sort of miscommunication there too, because that communication around masking wasn't sent out until yesterday afternoon. So it's only gonna be in effect until this Friday, which is four days. Um, so I think uh, I think that was it. I mean, I, I know I don't have much time, but I just wanna say, um, I'm not a politician, right? Like in any of your chairs, I'm not, I'm not done this for 20 years. I'm not wanted to be mayor. Um, None of that appeals to me, sitting around deciding all of these things does not appeal to me. Um, I'm coming to you because you guys have put yourself in the seats as public servants, whether or not you like me or any of my activism or any issues that we disagreed on before, I would hope that you, especially 
you, Vic, who live in Hilton, that you who care about the kinds of people who get left out of swimming, the kinds of kids who are more likely to drown, the kinds of kids who will not learn and become adults of children who cannot swim. My own husband cannot swim. Um, I would hope that you guys would take this issue a lot more seriously, take what's happening and destroying the high school pool more seriously and really think about whether or not you can wait in here. Um, that's it. I, I hope I hope you guys listen. Thanks. Mayor, next I have Heather Soslovsky. We'll convert to a panelist and allow you three minutes to speak. Good evening again. So first I'd like to note that there's no reason to apologize for me. I speak only for myself and you've never apologized for your colleagues even when they cursed at our own police officers. Um, I've been gaslit, I've asked nicely. I don't necessarily get answers. Sometimes we take other tactics when we don't get answers. Um, separately, I'd like to note, I spoke about autism drowning before and I'm telling you again, Dr. White just mentioned it but I'd like to give you some statistics. 50% of children with autism under the age of four wander from safe locations. Of the deaths associated with wandering, 91% are drowning, 91%. Those statistics are staggering. I've mentioned them here before. The fact that the pilot project is now reduced to not include special needs children is atrocious. That is the first and most important population you had promised to meet. I hope that no mo may means no code enforcement either, Ms. Adams. I didn't hear that part. I'd like to, I'd like that to be public so that we know we can do that. I'd like to know how Mr. Dapis said that the bond is for a dive tower that's already being worked on. Is that, how is this payment working? Additionally, since there have been all these school outbreaks and this uptick that we heard about, I'd like to know if, the if this has impacted your discussions regarding town in-person events regarding recreation department programming that includes mixing children from all different grades, ages, and schools. And what, if anything, this changes with regard to kids camp, which on inclement days puts all of the children together inside of the DeHart Community Center. Finally, the most aggressive thing around here is COVID. And you haven't acknowledged that we lost another resident this week. So I would do that for you now. We lost another resident of Maplewood this week to COVID just yesterday. I'd like to know how that impacts your decision-making and why you're not ranting about that. I agree we should all be upset about Roe v. Wade, but you have no control over that. This is our community. These are our residents. And I'd ask you to take very seriously how we all feel about this because many in our community are grieving. Many in our community have long COVID. Mr. McGeehee himself said last time, that but for science, he wasn't sure he would have made it. Many of us feel that way. We don't want our children to experience this. We don't want it repeatedly. We 30 don't seconds. They are rolling his eyes while we're speaking. So yeah, we're a little unhappy. Um, sometimes we rant as our you know, elected officials roll their eyes at us. Currently 20% of the deaths in Maplewood happened in this calendar year in 2022. So what, if anything, is Maplewood doing not to be the leader in COVID transmission, in COVID illness, in long COVID and in mortality? Because compare our rates to our neighbors. We Ten have higher, much higher rates than our neighbors in other areas of Essex County per capita, much higher. You're a leader. You're a leader in COVID. I think we have Mr. Morris is next, Mr. Waltz. Yes, Mayor, next we have Bert Morris. We'll convert you a panelist in like three minutes. Okay, I'm on now. Thank you all very much. Um, I think last time when I got on, I, I didn't really completely state my name, Bert Morris, and now nine years today living at 192 Burnett Avenue, unit C9. I'm, in the Hilton area of um, Maplewood. So um, fully, as I say, um, support all efforts for um, have ac all people to have access to swimming and particularly uh, in the schools and that the pool um, be repaired. But a couple of other things I want to bring up on the recycling. I know a few years ago, we went back, to, I think, to no 
number five plastics being recyclable, but on a lot of the inform, and I think on the website it is listed as number five, being along with one and two. But down at the recycling center, the the signs that are up just say um, plastics one and two are recyclable. And I was asking a person down there maybe about two or three weeks back and going by that's what's on the um, science. So um, I just want some clarification that we're okay. Like I'm putting number five plastics out in the recycling. And, and one other area I just want to bring up with New Jersey transit. I went there at the train station when getting up, particularly from the eastbound track, whether you're boarding, it's a, step is like way up um, because we've worried like with the ground is to um with the step and getting off it you really got to step like way down and and hold if there's anything that can be done on the west bound side i feel like say it's not nearly like too bad there but particularly on the eastbound side if there's anything like the township committee members you can do with new jersey transit on that would be greatly, greatly appreciated. That's all I have for tonight. Thank you very much. Mayor, I see no one else. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Waltz. I'm communicating with Health Officer Robin and I just want to state for the record that we here at the Health Department do not have a confirmed death uh, from COVID that happened just yesterday um, and we will follow up on that. So um, this brings us to um, a motion to adjourn out of our current session and to resume as the local ABC. Do I get a motion? I move. I move we adjourn the Township Committee meeting and move into the local Alcoholic Beverage Control Commission meeting. Second. Sounds. Yes. All right, Mr. Luca. Yes. Mr. McGee. Yes. Mayor Daffs. Yes. Okay, uh, Mayor, are you ready for me to uh, uh, start the? Uh, convene this ABC hearing. We are ready. Ms. Hudson, we need to move Mr. Morris back to audience. <laughs> we need to move some people over. Over. <laughs> yeah, we need to move Mr. Morris out and uh, the ABC attorney and uh, his clients. Ms. Fritzen, can you please just um, list the first and last names of everyone so I can make sure I have the proper people over? We have an L. Dowd. Lisa Dowd would be an uh, applicant. Maybe she can tell us who else should come over. I would assume R. I should, R Williams, Mr. Williams. Hi. Hi, I'm Lisa Dowd. How are you? Who else is coming with you for the hearing? Uh, Robert Williams, my attorney. Is there a chance um, that Robert might be in here as Carol Williams? It's that's, possible. Okay, yes. that's that's the name I'm seeing. So I just want to make sure. Yeah, I think so. Is that? Is there anyone else? Uh, that's it. Okay. Two of us. Okay. Uh, Mayor, are you ready for me to proceed? Hello, uh, members of the uh, Maplewood Local ABC. First, I'd just like to start by taking a roll call of uh, the local ABC members, please. Ms. Adams? Yeah, my video is not on. That's, okay. It's Robert Williams. Okay. Ms. Adams? Here. Ms. Kreit? Mr. DeLuca? Here. Mr. Gigi? Here. And Mayor Daffis? Here. Hey, members of the local ABC, uh, I just want to first introduce 
uh, our topic for tonight for uh, tonight's hearing. Uh, this is uh, a new license, uh, plenary retail consumption license number that uh, would be assigned by the state of New Jersey ABC. And the person or entity that will hold an interest in this license are uh, Lisa Dow, Maplewood Cinemas LLC, trading as the Maplewood, 153, 155 Maplewood Avenue, Maplewood, New Jersey. Mr. Desiderio, did you want to uh, swear in? Well, let me, let me first off, Mr. Williams, are you trying to get on in video or are you just on the phone? You're muted. Okay. Well, here, start, hold on. I might be able to do this. Here we ah, are. There you are. We got you. How about that, right? You got to turn, the, you have to turn the camera on, Mr. Williams. How are you? Well, I'm doing fine. Thank you, Mr. Desiderio. Okay. Um, you want to make a presentation before yes. I show you yes. what Sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Robert C. Williams appearing on behalf of Maplewood Cinemas LLC, the applicant and its sole member, Lisa Dowd, who's already introduced herself. Um, by resolution 85-22, on March 1st, 2022, you as a local ABC board uh, determined that the applicant Maplewood Cinemas LLC was the highest qualified bidder for the new liquor license, the new plenary retail consumption license and accepted a bid of $490,000. That money was promptly paid and is on deposit in your municipality. We would like you tonight to pass another resolution, which is resolution 3 157 22, approving the issuance of this new license in your community for use at 153 155 Maplewood Avenue, commonly referred to as the Maplewood Theater, um, so that we can move forward with this project. Uh, we are looking forward to redeveloping the site. We understand based on the way the a license was advertised that it must be used in uh, a theater or a eat-in restaurant. And we certainly intend to comply with that requirement. There's a special condition that you are entitled to put on a license pursuant to NJSA 33-1-32. Subsequent to the award of the bid to my client, my client, the sole member, Lisa Dowd, was totally vetted by your police department. She was fingerprinted. All sources of investment were scrutinized by your town. The uh, issuance of this license was properly advertised. And I believe you can have your uh, clerk, uh, Liz Fritzen, uh, confirm that she has received a favorable report and that there is nothing else left for you to do but the past the resolution approving the issuance of this license at this location. I have with me tonight, a vote, quiet. Um, Liz Dowd, who's the sole member of the entity, is looking forward to moving forward. And since this is a new license, um, I would encourage you to vote favorably on it as proposed on your agenda. I don't know, Robert, I keep my dog quiet. <laughs> yeah, we, I live in a high crime area. He has to park. So we're open to any questions that I can be of any assistance. Liz is here. Um, we've complied with every regulation. We've met every requirement of 331-25, which was would be a prerequisite for you approving this. Uh, there's nothing more for that we can do. We've paid our money. We've filed all the applications. We'd like the opportunity uh, to develop this site and to bring uh, a quality restaurant and hopefully a movie theater to the uh, location that you all of you are very familiar with. Um, Maplewood is definitely a favorite area and we want to join with you in taking this opportunity to move forward. Mr. Williams, I'm gonna swear your client, please. Sure. Ms. Dad, would you raise your right hand? You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. 
Okay, Ms. Fritzen, uh, Mr. Williams made certain representations, which I believe are correct. Can you confirm that all the necessary statutory requirements have been complied with, including, uh, including publication? Yes, that's correct. Have we heard from any member of the public objecting to this transfer? No objections. Have been, have been received? Correct. So Ms. Dowd, I guess the fundamental question is, when will you be opening, in the next week or two? <laughs> well, uh, I, say, I, I say that tongue in cheek, but seriously, when will we be opening? The, 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 the key point here is that this ne license needs to be in use as quickly as possible. So tell us when it's gonna be in use. I can't give an exact date, but it's gonna be as quick as possible. We no. are as eager as you are to get the license in use and get you know the, the space filled and you know get something in there as, as quickly as we possibly can. Is the space, do you, you have presently have any leases in place between your entity and any other entity? <laughs> Not right now. There's not a lease in place now. There's no lease. In, there is no lease in place. Can I, uh, can I just jump in there for a second, Council? Uh, well, it's in, in, it's fairness, illegal. in fairness, Mr. Williams, why don't you ask her when I'm done? Okay. Is but there's a, it's, it's a legal question. You can't lease a liquor license. It's against the I didn't law. ask her. I didn't ask her if she was leasing a liquor license. If that was the intent, Ms. Dad, I apologize. I agree with Mr. Williams 100%. Do you have a lease for space to locate the liquor license? Yes. Yes, I do. Oh, okay. Where, wh wh with whom do you have the lease? With the landlord. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> can you tell me who that is? Anthony Lafredo. Okay, and you can produce that lease? I can. Okay, and it's effective what date? I would have to go back and get the date that it's effective, but I, I don't have it okay. in front of me, but I, I do know a lease is effective. Okay, and what is the, and, and can you describe the space, the, the lease space for us, please? The lease space? Yeah, describe the space that you have leased, that your entity has leased from Mr. Lafredo, who's your father, correct? Yes, he is. Yeah, right. I mean, we all, we all, everybody knows everybody. So right, that, right. it's not an issue, but I'd like you to describe the space that you've leased. I've leased the Maple Theater. I've leased the, the entire space of the Maple Theater. Okay. And and you're intending to put the, the license where in relationship? So it's a, it's a theater. So how are you going to put the license in there? How are you going to sell liquor in there? Well, we're intending to do some type of restaurant within the theater. So it may not be a movie theater anymore. Uh, it may be just a restaurant in there with a liquor license. It may be a restaurant in the front with the liquor, with the maybe a smaller theater section in the back with possibly something else as well. Maybe right now there's five movie theaters. Maybe there will be two theaters and something else in the other spaces with a restaurant in the front uh, for the liquor license to be used at. Well, what specific, so I guess I'd like to try to get you, give me some specifics. It's been at least six months since you've had this license application has been pending. What specifics have been taken with regard to trying to specify space for the location of the license? Well, we haven't been able to uh, publicly list, you know, the property with a commercial agent as having a liquor license available because, you know, we couldn't list saying that we had a liquor license available when we did not have a liquor license. Um, so, you know, that was um, is, it, is, is the property, and I know it's not your property, I know you're a tenant, but do you know whether or not the property is presently listed with a, with a realtor of any kind? Yes, it is. Okay, who, with whom is it listed? I don't know that I, I don't know, but it is listed with a commercial realtor. Okay. Are there any signs out front listing it? Not right now. Okay. I don't believe so. And have you had any um, uh, architectural plans or any kind of interior design plans with regard to space? Have you engaged anybody in that regard? Well, no, uh, not yet, because we didn't have a liquor license to kind of, you know, to do that yet. Um, it's a little hard to advertise a liquor license if, you know, we didn't have the license. So that that wouldn't, couldn't happen yet. Um, but we're hoping that once, you know, if we could, you know, if we got the license, then we could, you know, advertise, advertise more, you know, uh, 
for the location with the license and bring in, you know, different ideas, joint venture projects, hopefully is what we were hoping. Okay. So you, so you don't have any specific plans right now? Not at the moment. Okay. No, but we're kind of working on it. Okay. Members of the township committee or ABC questions. No, I guess I just want some clarity on. So there's no business plan yet. There's no, what is your, what is the timeline that you think you're going to do something with this liquor license or is the intention to just keep it? Popular? No, 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 they, we don't plan on just keeping it. Our intention is to, to use it right away. I mean, as soon as possible. Our intention is that once we have the liquor license to contact our uh, commercial, you know, the landlords who, you know, you know, is my father, a uh, commercial real estate agent that he is working with and make sure that they are aware that now there is a liquor license uh, that could be advertised um, and try to, you know, publicly put it out, you know, make, you know, get uh, interest in it, get better, you know, hopefully you know, broader interest in the location with the license. And would this be your first um, venture into this kind of business? I worked in uh, the restaurant business uh, for many years with, with my family. Uh, at, uh, you all know the Roman Gourmet. I worked there for many, many years before I had kids. Um, I stopped working there when I had kids, but I did work there for many years. So so you're hoping to find someone to run a business using this liquor license, but you would actually just be, it'd be a partnership or? Yes, it would be a partnership. It would be a joint venture. So you don't have a timeline of when something might happen. I, I would say within a year. I would hope within a year, definitely within a year. That you'd have an agreement or that you'd be open and operating? I don't see how that's possible. Yeah, I don't see, I don't know. I don't know if it'd be open and operating within a year. I, I can't, I couldn't guarantee that, but I would hope that we'd have an agreement within a year and that it would certain, something would definitely be under construction, I would think. I think, you know, the location needs some work, so. Just that if, if the, if the, and I, I think we can all, know that the theater business is just a problem. Uh, what what are your plans if you are not able to attract a restaurant tour to that location? Do you have any plans in that regard? I guess the moment we're hoping we will be able to. Okay. Maplewood Village is is a you know a great town. I lived there myself for many years. Uh, a lot of people love that town. It's got the train station right there. And um, we're hoping that that won't be a problem, that we will attract a restaurant that, that you know, everybody wants to be in Maplewood Village. Any other questions? I have a, I have a couple. Um, Ms. Dad, you, you said that there might be a restaurant in front of the theater. Are you talking about in the theater space or are you talking about another property in that building? No, I'm talking about in the theater space itself. Okay, would that theater, would that restaurant have uh, street access? How, how would, have you thought about how that would work? Would it have frontage on the street? We would have to rethink uh, other locations, I guess, that are, you know, maybe to give the restaurant some frontage. Um, you know, maybe there's other options that we've talked about. Maybe, you know, there's the Caldwell Banker site there, uh, the location to the right of the movie theater or to the left of the movie theater, we, either way. Um, maybe the fish mart, you know, there's, there's a few options. Uh, you know, there is the entrance to the theater itself. Um, so, you know, it kind of opens up to the back. So there's the option of something, a, a bar restaurant being positioned right in the entrance, type, you know, uh, where, where now is the 
concession stand, I believe it is, of the movie theater. And and you, but you haven't done any kind of back of the envelope sketches of anything like this, right? No, I have not. Not yet. Okay. We have not gotten that far. And um, I believe either it was your, I think your attorney or our attorney said that, um, you know, the condition of the license is for an eat-in restaurant or a theater. Um, you're aware of that, correct? Yes, that's right. Okay. And are, is it your testimony to us tonight that you are going to open up one of those and meet that criteria? One of those. I, I, I can't guarantee it's going to be a theater, but I can tell you it would be an Eden restaurant then if it was not a theater. And, and what gives you that confidence to say that? I think that my father, who owns the building, has owned also a restaurant in Maplewood Village before, besides the Roman Gourmet. Um, I think that he, uh, many years ago, uh, he owned, uh, it used to be Giovanna's restaurant. Um, I can't remember the name of the street. Was uh, it, was on, was on, it was on Highland, absolutely. Highland, yes, it was on Highland. Um, and he ran a very great restaurant there. He runs the Roman Gourmet, uh, you know, ran the Roman Gourmet. Uh, my brother who now runs the Roman Gourmet, I think if something, you know, will come of it, um, even if it meant maybe us building it ourselves, you know, as a family, um, opening up our own restaurant, you know, maybe that's something that we would do. Uh, me okay, and my brother, maybe, you know, you're asking us to vote tonight to give you a license that has a clear stipulation that says you have to have an eat-in restaurant or a theater. Um, and you're you're answering truthfully. I believe you know you're you're a believable person, and you're you're telling us that it's possible that this is going to come. But I guess the question is. You know, you've also said that you haven't done any kind of estimates, you haven't done any kind of design, you haven't really engaged the, the real estate community, um, looking for partners. And I know you said that you didn't have assurance that you were going to get the liquor license, but you knew that it was a possibility. Could you tell us if you've had any conversations with anyone that gives you that confidence that you're going to open up a need in restaurant or a theater. Well, I mean, so there were, you know, potential uh, people that were interested in the location um, as a joint venture, you know, with us uh, to open up thing, you know, open up, a, send, uh, a restaurant in there using the liquor license with um, not a movie theater, but putting on like a live shows and um, a type of lounge area for adults and things like that. Um, that did, you know, it did not work out. It fell through. Um, so there, there has been interest in the location already uh, from, you know, uh, with COVID, I think there was lots of scares and, you know, uh, the location does require, um, you know, some investments. So I think some people did get, you know, a little, with COVID, I think people got a little scared, you know, and backed out, but that, that was, you know, how this um, was going. It just... Mayor, did you have questions also or not? I do, I have a few questions, thank you. Uh, first of all, Ms. Dowd, it's really nice to meet you. Um, nice to meet you too. Yeah, to put a face to the name. Um, as you know, I've been engaged in this for over a year now, uh, really sincerely trying to find a way to make this work with your dad, who reminds me of my dad. <laughs> the <old> country, <laughs> right? They have a certain way about them. Right. Um, and you know, you talked about you know the interest earlier on uh, that didn't work out. How many other interested parties have you spoken to since that fell apart? 
Um, I would say maybe two others. There were about two other people interested. Okay, who were not part of that original group. Right, who were not part of that original group. Because the original group had to do with, you know, people who were who are experts in cinema and uh, connected to a restaurant group. So you're saying that you spoke to two other persons other than those persons. Yes. And what kinds of capital improvements have you engaged in in the past nine months now to make the property attractive to interested tenants? Well, we put on a whole new roof um, on the building. We have cleaned out the movie theater thoroughly. Uh, it was uh, the previous tenants had left quite a mess behind. Um, so the movie theater has been cleaned out. Uh, everything has been sanitized. Um, new drop ceiling has been put in. Um, all the carpets have been cleaned and sanitized. Uh, uh, sure, sure. You know, that, that's, that's what we've done right now. When was this cleanup effort done? It was just completed recently. Recently. So, so many, many months after you were aware of the possibility of you um, having a liquor license, your dad had done what he could. Well, we, it took a while to get people right now. It's very, very difficult to get people to work. Um, so we really had to, you know, we, we found people and then, you know, we got people in there. We had to get dumpsters, which we got. Um, it, it did take some time for us to arrange to get people in there to do the work. Um, it wasn't, you know, not the easiest time right now to find people to work. As I'm sure, you know, it, it's, 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 it's not easy to find people to get in there to do the actual, you know, just, it took us two months just to get a roofer, you know? Yeah. Um, and then once we secured the roofer, it took another month and a half for them to start. And then once they started, then it was delays with the rain. And then, you know, it's just, so it's, you know, the roof itself, just the roof itself before any uh, thing could be done on the inside, the roof had to be completed because it was leaking. So, um, Nothing could be done on the inside until the roof was completed. And that I would say the roof itself took, you know, three to four months to get completed. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and then, then as soon as the roof was done, then we got the company to come in and clean out the inside. Mm -hmm. And you've talked about possibly engaging with a restaurant so that maybe it would just be a restaurant space. Um, and you mentioned the Coldwell Banker location, which is an existing tenant on a long-term lease, right? They have about two years left on their lease. Oh, they have about two years left on their lease. And um, is it fair to say that some of the previous interest in that space um, was something that maybe um, you all were not interested in engaging in, at least at the time? At the time, uh, I don't know. That I, I do not know. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not understanding. Meaning with the previous restaurant interest in right. that. Coldwell Banker space. Right. Isn't it fair to say that that group that came in wanted to have that sidewalk, sidewalk facing, which is what. Well, that would be like, I don't. So when I say the Coldwell Banker space, I guess what I mean is maybe a piece of the Coldwell Banker space. Um, I believe that previous person that was interested wanted the entire Coldwell Banker space. I that see. is not a possibility. Um, I do not believe that that would be a possibility. When I say a Coldwell Banker space, maybe my father could arrange with Coldwell Banker to, for them to take a smaller location with reducing the rent, um, oh. you know, but not the entire space as in putting a restaurant in their space of Coldwell Banker, I don't see that happening. Sure. Um, Thanks, for the, clarifying that. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, so you mentioned earlier that, you know, the inside of the space is going to require significant capital improvements, right? To make any work in there, whether it's a theater or it's a restaurant or it's a, a little bit of both. You mentioned a performance space, you know, that was some of the early interest in the space. Um, at this time, is there any interest um, on your family's part to sell 
the property in order to make financing for such capital improvements a little bit easier? To sell the building or to sell to sell the entire, what, I'm sorry, just- Either, either the building or subdividing and, and you know, into a co-op ownership of just the space. Yeah, I think there is, yes. I think there's room for that. I mean, I, I don't think the whole building is for sale, if that's what you're asking. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's not gonna happen. Um, I think maybe there is room for the Maple Leaf Theater to be for sale. Yeah, I think so. I don't think that's out of the question. I'm sure me and my father could talk about that a little bit more. You've talked to your dad about this? <laughs> I have. I'm sure, you know, I could get him if you wanted him on the call. I talked <laughs> to him about that. Yep. It hasn't been, um, you know, something that he was willing to entertain during some of these interested parties discussions. Which the building makes or the, the Maplewood Theater spot? There's two different, the he's not going to entertain the building. The Maplewood Theater spot. I think he would entertain it. Okay, so it's a maybe though, right? It's definitely a maybe. It's definitely not a hard no, I will tell you that. I, I can't guarantee you that. I mean, but it's definitely a maybe. I, I think it's, um, I think, I think, I think the price would have to be right. I think he'd have to get the, you know, I think it's really, you know, right. I mean, I think he'd have to be offered the the right amount for what he thinks that the Maplewood Theater, you know, space is worth. It's a big location and, you know, it's a lot of square footage. Great, thank you. I have no other questions. Thank Mr. you. Mr. McGee, I think everybody else has had a turn. No? I've heard enough from my colleagues, I'm good. Okay. Uh, Mr. Williams, would you like to come I'm, back? This is Dario, I'm sorry. I do have a, just a couple other questions. I'm sorry. Uh, Ms. Dad, you um, are you authorized to speak for your father here? Because you seem to be doing that. Um, am I authorized to speak for him? Um, no. I'm not speaking for him. No, I'm not putting up his property for sale. If that's what you're saying, no. Well, okay, I, you, so, you would so, have to run this past him, of course. Okay. I'm not speaking for him. No. So your 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 interest in your lease is just for the theater, right? So it's not for the for either all or a portion of the realtor's office, correct? Yeah, no, my, my interest is for the theater. Yeah, okay. not the realtor's office. Okay. But you but you you're you're saying that you've had some conversations with the landlord and there might be something there. I'm saying if we couldn't find uh yeah, somebody, you know, without a little bit of a storefront, you know, without giving maybe a, a an entrance there for the for the a restaurant, maybe we would have to cut into a little bit of one of the side pieces to kind of create that. Yeah. And there has been talk about that. And if you were uh, to, if you were to create the restaurant in the front and you you sort of talked about the bar being where the popcorn stand is, um, what would happen with the rest of that building? Building's big. There's a lot of space back there. I don't think that a restaurant itself needs all that space. I right. think it would be crazy. I mean, I think that would just be too much square footage for a restaurant itself. Um, I think that, uh, you know, some of it would be used as storage. I think uh, that my brother who has, you know, has the room and gourmet next door, you know, really could use storage. Uh, maybe there would be, you know, one of the theaters would go to him maybe, you know, and, and, and make an entrance from the back kitchen into the, one of the theaters to give him storage space, maybe. Um, I, you know, that's, that was talked about a little bit. Um, I, I think the space is, you know, if it was just a restaurant, it's just too large. The square footage is would too you, large. Would you think of anything else there, like, um, uh, you know, recreations, indoor recreation center? I mean, what or... I would love to see there, uh, you know, what I would love to see is, you um, a restaurant in the front, you know, with a bar and, you know, I have two small children myself. So uh, what I would, and I lived in Maplewood, what I would love to see is a recreation center. Okay. So you walk in and there's a restaurant and a bar for parents to hang out in with some TVs and, 
you kind of go into the back and maybe one of the theaters is an arcade. Um, you know, mm -hmm. maybe one of the theaters is a, a basketball court. Maybe one of the theaters is a roller skating rink. Maybe one of the theaters is, uh, I don't know, trampolines for smaller kids. Um, or maybe one of them is a room to host parties, like just a party room for parents to rent out to host birthday parties for kids on Saturday mornings. Um, you know, that's what I would love to see. And then a restaurant in the front for, for, for the, for parents, you know, to, to, you know, kind of make it, you know, little kid friendly section, you know, with a, you know, pizza and stuff, you know, from the pizzeria and then a more restaurant bar for the parents. That's what I would love to see there. Um, Thank you. Any of my other members of the township committee? Mr. Williams, would you like to make some remarks? Yes, I would. Thank you, Council. Um, first off, uh, I know the term was used, I believe, by uh, Ms. Adams, and uh, she referred to this as, a, are, are you going to keep it as a pocket license? Uh, we're not asking this to be uh, taken as a pocket license. We're asking you to approve the issuance of a new license at this location. Unfortunately, because of the status of the building, it will be located at this um, entity, the uh, theater, but it will be inactive. So it won't be a pocket where it won't have a home. It will be located here. Under the New Jersey statute um, 33-1-12.39, a license must be actively used two years prior to renewal. If it's not, the Division of Alcohol Beverage Control, but more particularly the director, has to be petitioned. You will be notified. So if for some reason this license isn't activated within two years, we have to go to the state to ask permission to renew it and advise you accordingly. Quite frankly, if we're under construction, there's been delays because of COVID or other calamities, the division is going to say, fine, we're going to give you more time as long as you're making a good faith effort to activate the license. Now, let's be practical. My client is paying $490,000 for a piece of paper, which they can't or she can't make any money on right away. It's to our advantage to get something open so we can start recouping some of our investment. You decided as a, as a governing body that you were entitled to issue a new license. You put a minimum bid on it of 420,000. We were 30,000 more than anybody else, $490,000. There's no downside to your community or to your governing body. The only downside is if we pay that amount of money, which we have already, and we don't use it, that would be insane. So I think you have the comfort level of knowing that somebody who's made this commitment, whose family already owns the property, is not just going to sit there and do nothing while they've made this investment. So I would encourage you to vote favorably on this. And remember that you're sitting here as an ABC board. Your only decision here is after you have awarded my client the, uh, the bid and has qualified her, and she's done everything under the law to satisfy the requirements, the only thing left to do is let her have the license. What would be the reason that you wouldn't let her have the license? Would it be that she's not going to open next week? That's not fair. Nobody can open next week in your community unless they already have a restaurant that's BYOB. And are they going to come in and pay that kind of money? You'd have to rebid everything and see if somebody with maybe 25 seats, table seats, is going to come in and pay that kind of money. So I'm asking you, just, just let her have the license. She's qualified. There's no reason not to give it to her. She's paid the money. And I can assure you that she's going to actively pursue either a joint venture or other options. And there are a number of them. But unfortunately, nobody really wants to talk to you when you say, I think I'm going to get a license. I was a bidder. Nobody wants to hire architects and spend additional money when they don't have the opportunity 
to convert this into a restaurant and theater. So I'd ask you to vote favorably. We have a motion. Does there, may I ask Mr. Williams a question? Of course. Of course. Of course. Mr. Williams, this is a uh, a person to person transfer, correct? No, it is not, sir. What is it? It's, a, it's an issuance of a new license. This license, license doesn't exist. We're not getting right. it from anybody yet. Okay, so it's a new license issuance. Right. It's, but it's to a person. It's not to a place. Is that correct? It's to both. To both. To both, Mr. DeLuca. It's both. It's, it's, so this is a place and a... Yes, it's the, you're issuing the license to Maplewood Cinema LLC for 153, 155 Maplewood Avenue, pursuant to the diagram that was attached to the license application, which shows you the Maplewood Theater. So this, this license cannot be used in any other building unless they come here and get permission for that. You're right? absolutely right. It's located there. If they want to do something else, expand the license, they have to come back. You retain jurisdiction. And if they were to use or they were to make a deal with the landlord to use a portion of the uh, any of those other storefronts, they would have to come back here? Yes, they'd have to come back for an expansion of license premises. And you would determine whether or not it was appropriate. Would they have to come back uh, dependent on who they partner with in business? Do they need the same approval or is this just... No, uh, if, if they... If they do what is known as a joint venture and they bring somebody in as part of the liquor license, they would have to file what is known as a change of corporate structure. Uh, even though it's an LLC, it's still referred to as the same term. The, the people come and it would have to be advertised in the paper and your municipality would have the right to investigate them. For some reason, they were unacceptable under the ABC regulations. You would have the, uh, the right to uh, have them removed. Mr. Williams, am I correct that if there was a restaurant tour and your client kept the license in her name, that they would not have to do that? Uh, they would have to uh, file what is known as a concessionaire's agreement to serve food. We would retain the um, privilege to sell liquor on the premises where they're serving the food. And we keep your, light, your client as responsible under the license. Absolutely. Correct. Okay. And let me just, let me just make sure that I, I have the addresses right. The 153, 155 is the movie theater. It's not Roman. That's not the address for Roman Gourmet. Is that correct? One, my, go ahead. Go ahead. Maybe my client can answer that. I'm not familiar with the address. Um, 153 is the is the Roman Gourmet. Uh, okay. 155 is the movie theater. I believe. I believe it's listed as 153, 155 because the theater is behind. Oh, yes, that's right, because the, the theater runs behind the pizzeria. It's the, part of one, 153, but we have a detailed sketch that we're bound by that was submitted with the application, which shows the licensed premises. Okay, I guess what I'm, I guess what I'm asking Ms. Dowd and, and Mr. Williams is, there's no intent to put the, the liquor license in the Roman Gourmet? Not at this time, no. Well, well, oh, okay, well, that... Wait, if, okay. if that were to happen, we'd have to come back. Okay, so you're yeah, if they were, okay, okay, we're not doing that. You're saying under this application, that is not the case. That you're absolutely correct. And where Appendix A was attached to the application, we're bound by. Okay, just want to make sure that we're clear. I appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Desiderio. Let's just take a look at that. Sure. That Appendix A. We're, um, I'm seeing something. That, is this the? Is this Mr. Halsey's land survey? No. No. Okay. It says Appendix A. Um, I can hold it up. It shows the theater and the area that's licensed. Uh, I do not. I do not have that. As we do not have that. I don't have uh, that. Either. It was filed with the application. Let's it's attached. What's it was, the Ms. Fritchen, Ms. Fritchen, do you have it? I don't remember seeing that. No, I had uh, the original application. Uh, original application had it. Well, I that was filed by another attorney. Yes. Correct. Yeah, he attached it. One in a series. What we have, yeah. we have, we have the survey from Mr. Halsey. Yeah, that, that survey is at the property. I, I don't know why that was filed. I didn't file it, but this is clearly what we're asking to have approved is a theater. 
Okay. That's it. So it's so clear. So, so you'll 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 supply that to us, Mr. Williams. Oh no, quite yes, absolutely. Okay. I believe that Mr. Fay did it on his application. He was the first attorney. I see the Halsey map as well as the only document that I have. Yeah. Okay. I have both. I have the, the license application from 1229 yep. to 2021, right? Yes. And yes. we got another one. And then you got the uh, red highlighted application yes. from. And neither of them have the. Have the problem. There was one filed October 29, 2021. The second one was December 29th. Okay. Yeah, well, I have the whole sketch. I, I will, I'll make it clear. I'll, I'll provide a copy of the sketch, but just for this record, it's very clear. It's the entrance to the uh, movie theater and then the theater itself. If we want to go beyond that, we have to come back and ask your permission. Any other questions? Anyone want to make a motion? Mr. Desiderio, do you want to just uh, refer to? No, 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 no. I want to know if somebody wants to make okay. a motion. So this is gonna fail by reason of the fact that there's been no motion. Well, I believe under the regulations and the statute, more particularly the um, guidelines that are sent to the municipality, you're gonna turn somebody down, you have to adopt a resolution, and you also have to tell us the reasons that you're relying on so that when we appeal to the division of ABC, they have an understanding why the license was denied. No action. Quite frankly, this would be no action. We're entitled to file an appeal and have it heard at the state because you didn't take any action. We understand your rights. No, but frankly, I'm surprised that um, we can't get a motion to approve this. All right, there's no motion to approve. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. I'll second when you adjourn. All in favor on adjournment? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Good evening. Sorry we had to go over the 9 30 deadline, right. but I appreciate the fact that you stayed to do this. And Ms. Dad, I, I want you to know that I have eaten at I have eaten at Giovanna's on several occasions. It was very good when your father and mother owned it. Thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs> okay. All right. I think thank you. Mr. Williams, thank you. Good seeing you. Good seeing you. Be well, everybody. Bye -bye.